Okay. Meg, I'll let you know when I start the, the live stream. And you let me know if the YouTube link works. Meg, um, I've started the live stream on YouTube. Let me know if you see it. Uh, yeah. It's on. Perfect. <laughs> okay, so yeah, are we ready? Okay, perfect. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Let me just, <laughs> yes. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We truly appreciate you spending part of your set Saturday with us today. I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. Um, we begin by acknowledging the lands on which we gather today. Science and Policy Exchange, SPE, is based in Chiochiage, Montreal the traditional and unceded territory of the Kanyukahaga, a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst many First Nations, including the Kanyukahaga of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron Wandat, Abinaki, and Anishinaabe. We further acknowledge the ties between colonialism and modern Western science and research, especially in Chilchiage, where it is host to a large research ecosystem. We encourage our participants to challenge their own ties to systems of oppressions that have marginalized Indigenous communities at SP. We strive to support Indigenous students and researchers by actively reaching out and to and working with Indigenous STEM community to collaboratively advocate for their inclusion in evidence-informed decision-making. In that spirit, I would like to highlight the following courses offered by the University of Alberta's Native Studies. Um, all of which are open to external auditors. First one is Can Indigenous Canada, which is a, a massive open online course that explores Indigenous histories and contemporary issues in Canada. Indigenous Peoples and Techno Science introduces students to the intricate connections between science and technology fields, broader dynamics of colonialism, and increasing demands for Indigenous governance of science and technology. 
countering stereotypes of indigenous peoples teaches students to unpack and challenge the narrative that both skew the lived experience of indigenous peoples and allows the replication of stereotypes that reinforce colonial relationships. The deadline to apply for both courses is September 16th to the 22nd for this fall, and it's also offered uh, for the winter semester. We encourage you to sign up to these courses to better understand the lands on which we gather today. In addition, we are thankful to Answerx Dimensions team for partnering with us and to our sponsors for supporting both this event and the upcoming French counterpart on September 27th. Our sponsors include Simon Fraser University, Quebec's provincial funding agencies, Les Fonds de Recherche du Québec, Université de Laval, McGill University, the University of Ottawa, and Wilfred Laurier. Thank you to our sponsors, not only for supporting this event, but to demonstrate that EDI is valued at many institutions across the country. We are also grateful to the dedicated and invaluable volunteers who have spent months preparing for this event and who continue to work behind the scenes today. I am extremely appreciative of their work and what they have achieved today and hope that we can help others do the same. Speaking of our volunteers, for those who are new to Science and Policy Exchange, also known as SPE, we are a student-led nonprofit based in Montreal that provides an open and accessible platform for the next generation of scientists and researchers to exchange ideas and perspectives, develop their networks and skills, and explore new solutions to emerging and persisting issues at their interface of science, policy, and society. We are also celebrating our 10th anniversary this year. A lot has changed over the past 10 years, but I'd like to invite you to wind the clocks back even further. 20 years ago, according to the Canadian census, women represented 47% of the total workforce, yet only 28% of physical sciences professionals and 11% of engineers. 20 years ago, 302 men were approved to receive a Canadian Research Chairs Award, in contrast to only 52 women that year. 20 years ago, the difference between percentage of doctorates working at university professors and the percentage of Canadians with doctorates was roughly minus 10%. Today marks the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 tax, which would become the catalyst for the war in Afghanistan. For those affected by the war, who are still feeling the impacts of the war, even to this day, there isn't anything I can say today that would be more meaningful than words from your family, your friends, or your community. It's easy to feel helpless and powerless, to feel afraid to say the wrong words or to do the wrong things. But I think we all have the potential to help make things just a little bit better for Muslim neighbors. And I think this is what we can do today. Over the past 20 years, Islamophobia gained international attention after the 9-11 attacks, and certainly Canada was no exception. In the past five years, more Muslims have been killed in targeted hate attacks in Canada than any other G7 country. We don't have to look beyond the 2017 Quebec mosque shooting, this past summer's London attacks, the growing number of hate attacks against Black Muslim women, and Quebec's Bill 21 to recognize the dire need for our societal structures to better support and to be more inclusive of our Muslim community. This past summer, the government of Canada hosted a national summit on Islamophobia, where they have committed to a number of actions on this issue. Some organizations followed up with their own recommendations, such as the National Council of Canadian Muslims. I would like to take some time to highlight some of their recommendations. Recommendation 11, a federal anti-Islamophobia strategy by year end, which would include a clear definition of Islamophobia, funding anti-Islamophobia work, including research program and education, and develop public education campaigns. Recommendation 23, allocate dedicated funding for the study of Islamophobia through SHRC, including related funding for tier two Canada research chairs postdoc fellowships, and research grants. Recommendations 20, 22, and 43 speak to the necessity to highlight and amplify the work of Canadian Muslims through our cultural and educational spaces. I would further add 
scientific spaces to the list. A good starting point would be to follow the work of Farah Quasar and Hajir Nakua, who have raised awareness of the experiences of Muslim scientists. The following link, which was shared in chat, for example, is a document written by Hajir that details how to be inclusive to our Muslim friends and colleagues during Ramadan. And recommendation 26 and 27 speak to the necessity to desegregate our data to inform better decision making in the future. To many of you, these recommendations may look familiar. I chose to present them to you today because many of you can actually act on them. Tackling something as daunting as Islamophobia is incredibly frightening. It's easy to feel helpless and powerless, to be afraid to say the wrong words or do the wrong things. But I assure you, once you overcome that initial fear, you do have the capacity to make things better. And that's why we're here today. Progress towards more equitable, diverse, inclusive academic and research spaces has been slow over the past 20 years and beyond. Gender parity is still lacking in many STEM fields. Indigenous representation is absent in many disciplines. And we lack comprehensive data and analyses on the experiences of gender diverse researchers on those, and those with disabilities. Even when data is available and diversity metrics are met, historically excluded groups still face additional barriers that inhibit, inhibit their full potential in academia. Progress has been slow over the past 20 years. However, recently we have seen some promising first few steps. In 2019, then Minister Dun Duncan launched Dimensions to Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Canada, a pilot program inspired by the UK's Athena's One program, which has yielded positive results in addressing gender equity. Budget 2019 committed 11 million towards an EDI institutional capacity grant that would support institutions to achieve their EDI goals. Budget 2019 also allocated 6 million to collect better data about researchers, which strengthened the use of GBA plus analyses. The C CRC program, Canadian Chairs program, Canadian Research Chairs program set new EDI targets recently for 2029. Almost every Canadian university has developed an EDR and or anti-racism action plan over the past year. And we have seen an increasing number of EDI committees at universities and research environments. And finally, budget 2021 committed 12 million to SHARC to fund academic research into systemic barriers facing diverse groups. This allowed them to recently launch their new race, gender and diversity initiative, which aims to support partnership research, partnership research to inform actions to address disparities related to race, gender, and other forms of diversity. These commitments paint and targets paint a hopeful picture. However, as people following the elections will know, targets don't lead to results. Action does. How do we move past the rhetoric to create real impact? How do we take real action on EDI? Today, we break that question down into the following three sub-questions. What makes a good EDI action plan? What initiatives are undertaken by EDI practitioners? And how can students contribute to EDI policymaking and implementation? Today's event aims to highlight the experiences of different stakeholders, to identify gaps in EDI initiatives, and to pave the way forward towards a more equitable, diverse, and inclusive academic and research environment to make sure that the next 20 years are better off than the previous ones. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker today, Natalie Podivsinski. Natalie is the project manager of the implement, for the implementation of Dimensions, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Canada that operates under ANSORG, but is administered jointly across all three funding agencies. And she will tell us more about the current state of the program, its findings and its future. Natalie. Thank you for this great introduction. Um, let me share my screen. <clears throat> All right. So yeah, thank you very much for this great invitation. It's a great way to spend a, a Saturday, even if it's a beautiful weather outside. Um, talking about EDI is always an important topic. 
Again, my name is Natalie Palisvinsky. I'm the project manager for Dimensions, and I'm happy to be with my colleague, Katie Saunier, who is a policy advisor in my team uh, on the Dimensions team. Um, I use the pronoun she, her. Uh, just to give a bit of background, I've been the project manager since the beginning, or even actually even before Dimension was actually in the budget. Uh, so I've had the chance to really develop this program since the beginning, especially I've had the chance to engage with the, some groups and individuals since uh, over the last three years, basically. Um, so it's been an absolute pleasure to, uh, to share some of your story. Um, and uh, I will, I can answer your questions in either French or English. I know it's the English session today, but um, uh, vous pouvez poser votre question en français dans le chat si uh, vous voulez. So as Anne-Cord said, uh, Dimensions is a tri-agency initiative and CERC is the lead agency for the implementation of this program. Uh, so the staff and the web content uh, related to Dimension is uh, on XERC's website. But the Dimensions team really work closely with uh, colleagues at CIHR uh, and at CERC. Uh, we also work closely with colleagues at TIPS, the Tri-Agency Institutional Program Secretariat that manages the Canada Research Shares Program. And of course, we also work with our EDI colleagues at NSERC. We are actually a team of not just for Dimension, EDI in general, as a team at NSERC. And I want to say that Dimension is one piece of the large EDI action plan that, of the agencies. Um, therefore, we fall under the umbrella of the Canada, the Canadian Research Coordinating Committee. So I will provide what, uh, what is Dimension for some of you who might not know what it is. I will provi provide some information on how did we get there. I will highlight some of the challenges we've been going through in the implementation of this program. I will present some of the program design elements, even if right now I'm not really supposed to since it's, it's an election. So these are the things that have been decided, but um, they're still, everything is still in development. Um, I will talk about some of the next steps we have for this project, and I will propose some of the timelines we're working with. So as we said, uh, Dimensions was introduced in budget 2018. The federal government actually presented many EDI initiatives in that budget. Um, and it was specifically mentioned that uh, it was the adoption of Athena Swan in Canada. So we really enjoy, we really like the fact that Athena Swan was coming to Canada, but we would have preferred not to have necessarily the, the trademark of Athena Swan, even um, as we modified it in Canada, the, the system was not necessarily the exact one. And you'll see that it brought us some challenges. Um, but that what is what said in the budget. So I mean, we we took the initiative on, uh, of course, and uh, it was also money, as mentioned before, for the institutional grants, uh, an institutional grants program uh, that is now called the EDI in, uh, Capacity Building Institutional Grants, which is close to ten million dollar. And um, so both programs are actually pilot programs, so they are due to expire March thirty first, twenty twenty three. So we are working very hard to to make sure that these programs uh, becomes more permanent. So I know EDI is on everybody's agenda right now, uh, but EDI actually has already has always played an important role within the agencies for many years. Programs like NSERC's Chairs for Women in Science and Engineering and events like the Gender Summit 11 North America are examples that predate dimensions. And of course, the Canada Research Chairs Program has helped uh, bring EDI to another level. The requirement to meet targets and also to have institutional EDI action plan really forced institutions to be serious about this. Um, there's also the New Frontiers in Research Fund um, that was announced, which is designed by the Canada, the Canada Research Coordinating Committee that is really putting EDI in the forefront. Um, and FRENF applicants are expected to consider EDI best practices when planning their research team's composition. Applicants must identify a minimum of one concrete practice that will implement that they will implement to ensure EDI is being intentionally and proactively considered and compose, composing the team and recruiting team members and so on. You can have more details, of course, on the NFREF website. 
Uh, I mentioned the Canada, the Chairs for Women in Science and Engineering, and uh, of course now we have Dimension. So I would say, in other words, Dimension is one of the tool in the toolbox of the agencies. So for those who doesn't know, who don't know Athena's One, the Athena's One program started more than 15 years ago uh, in the UK. It was the merger of two grassroots groups, the Athena, the Athena Group, and the Science Women Advancement Network, or the SWAN. And uh, the Athena's One started by focusing on women in STEM, and they have built on some good exper good experiences that they are able to share now uh, with the different countries that decided to bring Athena's One. Advanced ICHI is actually the organization that manages the program Athena's One label and the program in the UK. And they are the group that is developing Athena's One internationally. So we've been in discussion, of course, with Advanced ICHI. We actually have regular phone calls with them. And um, Athena's One has been exported in Ireland, Australia, the United States, and now Canada. And they have planned to export it to Japan, India, and many South American countries. And I, I will explain a bit later, but Dimensions is much broader in scope, uh, which means that the process needs to be adapted to the Canadian realities. But basically how Athena Swan work is that you collect quantitative and qualitative data, you criti critically analyze the data and identify the gaps, identify reasons for inclusion and underrepresentation, develop a four-year action plan, show progress over time, and then you repeat this exercise. So in preparation for the implementation of the Made in Canada Athena's One program, NSERC led many consultations and engagement sessions. First, we consulted with our partners internationally who have adopted and adapted Athena's One, so in the UK, Australia, and the United States. NSERC then moved to a consultations with the academic sector with a first round of consultation in fall 2018. The summary report of those first round of that first round of consultation can is available on Atrix's website. And then workshops were held in, uh, during that time in six uh, different cities: Vancouver, Calgary, Winnipeg, Montreal, Halifax, and Toronto. And we received a lot of online comments. Also, overall, some general issues that were raised were some of the were and some potential solutions were brought to our attention and some specific points were raised with regards to data collection more specifically. In sum, what we've heard is that the buy-in from all is essential. It's important of consulting the underrepresented groups and not just um, the VPR or the president of an institution. There's challenges in gathering qualitative and quantitative data. It is a challenge to build a smart action plan. And I guess we'll give a bit of trick after in our presentation. The workload often tends to fall under the underrepresented groups, so continuing the, the, the stigma. And people said that the program in Canada should then be more flexible and meets the reality of institutions, that Dimension should provide assistance throughout the process to the institution to put in place um, EDI activities, and that we should ensure that the qualitative measures are considered. So then answer drafted uh, a set of principles that were based on the comments received during the, the first round of consultation. And we then moved to a second round of consultation to really get even more comments on that proposed charter. We visited 17 institutions um, spread in all provinces and one territory, Yukon. And with the feedback received, we were able to release a final charter that you can find on our website. And that was announced by the then Minister of Science, Christy Duncan on May 9th. So I think we mentioned that Athena Swine was focusing on women in STEM. And uh, the scope of Dimension now is much more comprehensive than, the, than any actually other international programs. And we're getting some attention because of it. Some people are curious to know if we're actually going to be able to, um, to do that. But in, in, in resume, it includes five groups. So four of the groups of the Equity Act women, indigenous peoples, people with disability and members of visible minorities or racialized groups. And we added the members of, L of the LGBTQ2 plus communities. Instead of just universities, we are uh, accepting colleges, CIGEPs, polytechnics and universities. And it's all faculties. So science, engineering, humanities, health, basically all. This makes the program, of course, design uniquely complex 
and uniquely ambitious, but we believe that this will have more impact for the benefit of the different communities. So with the necessity to revise the program, rewrite the documentation and rethink the approach based on the decision to broaden the scope. And most of all, in order to have a manageable pilot, we decided to go with a letter of intent process to select institutions to be in the pilot. The LOI application included, and that's what institution had to present it to us, an institutional overview. So who were their clientele, where were they situated? What is their institutional commitment towards EDI? A description of what could be their self-assessment team, an overview of their data collection and use, and finally a description of their, if they had any EDI related measures. Institution had just over a month to send their LOI and then a committee of seven experts and four agency representatives basically chose the pilot. The committee were looking at different principles uh, that they had in mind for choosing some of the institution. A balance of institution type sizes and geographic locations, but also we wanted to have institutions that, are, that were really at different stages of their EDI progress. And some of the point that keeps coming is that institution needs to have the ability to share inward and outward, especially in terms of the co-development approach, and um, a lot on the mutuality and that EDI should not be treated as a competitive aspect in institution, but that institution in Canada should share good practices for the great of all institutions. So here's an overview of the 17 institutions that were chosen to be in the pilot. There's 12 universities, five colleges, and uh, to, for your information, there was actually 40 applications that we received and we chose those 17 out of the 40. The 23 other institutions that sent a letter but didn't get selected, uh, we call them our affiliates. You will hear me talk about them sometimes. Um, we don't engage as much with them as the cohort, but they're still a group that we, um, that we ask to participate in some of our working groups and some of our webinars. Um, so that we keep them informed and then we, uh, we also um, get some of their advice on, on the development of the program. So in more details, what exactly is Dimension? A Dimension is a two part. It's a charter of principles that I said you can find on NSU's website. Different organization can sign the charter. You don't need to apply to get a recognition to actually sign the charter. Signing the charter shows your institution cares about EDI. We are now at 128 charter endorsements for which the majority are of course post secondary institution, but we also have some federal government um, departments that decided to sign the letter, especially departments that have a scientific um, aspect to it. And uh, we also have a variety of uh, organization and the list of signatories is on the website. So you can go to see if your institution actually signed the charter. If they didn't, you can encourage your management to, uh, to sign this charter. The second part of the pilot program is, a post -secondary institution, is for post-secondary institutions seeking public recognition for their efforts in increasing EDI in their environments. I will provide a bit more details on, on that also. So the program uh, structure is a result, like I said, of this cross-country consultation to make it uniquely adapted to the Canadian realities. So why would institutions want to receive a dimensions recognition? The 17 cohort participants tell us that the fact that they are in dimensions pilot already helps them remove some of the silos and to coordinate the EDI efforts in their institutions. The dimensions pilot participants said also by, that by signing the charter and applying for recognition sends a signal to their faculty, staff and students that the institution is serious about EDI. And in other countries, Athena's one and similar programs are seen as making culture change. So we are very excited to uh, implement such a program in Canada. So like I said, since Dimensions is quite different from Athena's one, uh, and unlike any other countries, we decided to not provide the all the material done in advance. Basically, right now, the cohort is actively participating in the co-development of Dimensions materials and documentation. 
In particular, we're workly, currently working on the Dimensions Handbook, the application, and the recognition scheme, and eventually the review process. It was actually at terms of participation to be a pilot participant. They were quite clear that what we were expecting of the institution. They had to provide extensive input to, into the draft material. They had to actively participate in various working groups. And we wanted them to create this community of practice where they could share the resources, the strategies, and the promised practices. And I have to say that we've witnessed some pretty, pretty awesome exchanges between the different institutions. So we're quite happy that the institutions are actually helping us develop this program. So we know that the program will be very adapted to their realities. So I'm often talking about different working groups that we're creating to, pull, to put stuff in place for dimensions. So this is a list of things that, of, of working groups that we have built over the last few months. Um, as you can see, it's pretty extensive and some have had many meetings for each of those working groups. Um, we make sure to always have a college or two in our working groups to make sure that we adapt the system to them because the realities of colleges and small universities is not the same as in large universities, as you can expect. So this, I'm going to talk about some different elements of the program that we've decided to change over the last few years. So in the UK, the, the way the, the award system works is it's bronze, silver, and gold. So you're either at the bronze level, and then you move to the silver, and then you move to the gold. You need to be a bronze first to be able to get to the gold, uh, to the silver, and then you have to be silver to go to gold. Um, so institutions in Canada didn't like this competitive slash Olympian kind of system. So um, we, um, we have been working hard right now to try to find um, a different approach that, that sounds a bit less competitive. Um, and, uh, and that Dimensions is a collaborative endeavor and uh, among institutions and the community of practice. So addressing EDI is best advanced when the practice is, is, is shared. It needs to be inclusive by design. So the way we do it is that we believe the voices are of the underrepresented group should be in the middle. The engagement strategy is an important pillar for the transformation. It should play a pivotal role. Um, the underrepresented group should be involved not only in the application process, but throughout the process, basically. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we want institutions to work together and to share information. So the mutuality is a very central part of dimensions. The application needs also the evaluation system needs to be context specific. It is critical to keep in mind throughout the dimensions process the context in which the institution is operating. So the program, the dimensions program, aims to be inclusive of institution of various type, uh, sizes, and location. Since the program is so different, the assessment program the process will have to be different. Um, and uh, of course, we don't want to forget that intersectionality is also a very important uh, part and should be very demonstrated in the application. And also that institutions should spend some time on finding uh, ways to measure the effectiveness of their intervention. There's no way you can see if, you're, um, if you're, what your efforts are and what you're doing is great if there's no way for you to actually uh, measure the effectiveness of your interventions like just not the number. A lot of people focuses on statistics and just the number, but if in a lab you do have your 50% uh, racialized groups, but then you don't, uh, you never talk to them in meetings, they're not involved as the other participants, well, you did not reach anything. And also that EDI can be part of research excellence. We're talking a lot about this within the agencies. You've probably heard of DORA, um, uh, the San Francisco Declaration, where there's, we're trying to find new ways to evaluate, basically, um, what, we what we define as research excellence. So this is very much still in development, but that would be something that we will work with for dimension, the voices would be in the middle, and then institution would have to show different types of, uh, of evidence to show that they are actually doing good work. So in terms of evidence of motivation, their gaps and needs, assets and obstacles, commitment, and then change. And of course, all this 
in a context specific. So um, you need to um, to make sure that the context of which in which the institution is um, is is important also. So I mentioned the handbook, which is of course a very important part. Um, uh, the content is not public yet. We're still developing it. While we're finished doing uh, the complete draft, we've received a lot of comments uh, in the last few weeks. So we're um, we're incorporating those comments. But basically, um, the program works with a self-assessment team. So how are you building a um, diversified assessment team? How are you going to do the engagement with the underrepresented groups? You need to do an environmental slash institutional scan. You need to collect qualitative and quantitative data. And then you need to write an actual action plan um, to make sure that your actions um, are in one place. I'm quickly going to talk about the fact that we are also encouraging our institution to, um, to exchange some of lessons learned from other institutions around the world that have um, adapted and adopted Athena's One. So we've paired all of the institutions in the cohort with institution in the UK and in Australia. Um, and we know some institution have actually called and, and had meetings with their, with their paired institution. And they said it was very valuable discussion, of course, to exchange um, some of their lessons learned. So as you can imagine, the challenges of dimensions is really the scope. Um, I guess there were there was a reason why in the UK they started with women in STEM. Uh, it was a smaller group and a smaller department that they could focus on. Um, so the fact that right now we uh, we have five groups um, and all faculties, it, it's making um, it's making dimensions a bit of a challenge. Um, the way we do it though is that dimension is focused on the research ecosystem. So we want it. We're not into, um, you know, the federal government is not managing uh, or doesn't want to go into provincial jurisdiction. So um, the content of the curriculum is not necessarily the things that we're looking for. Uh, if an institutions want to do that, they're free to do it. But we're as an as a funding as funding agencies, the three the three agencies, we want institution to focus really on on the the research ecosystem. So the staff, but also the the content of the research. Uh, as you know, um, we don't want to tax, again, be one of the other group that uh, uh, organization that will tax the members of the underrepresented groups, um, because that can be quickly become a vicious circle. The collection of data in Canada is, is still not embedded in many institutions, um, either qualitative or quantitative. Um, and um, I'm sure some of the, your panelists this afternoon will talk about it. And we want to make sure that we make meaningful changes for institution. I guess there were still a lot of program uh, that were put in place, but then we didn't re really see results uh, in the long run. So we hope that uh, Dimensions will bring this um, this aspect to, um, uh, to and, and really get to the root of the problem, if we can. So what is next is that right now we're finalizing all our pilot, our pilot materials um, and uh, we want to be able to release some documentation over the next months, uh, probably in the new year uh, in, in a more general way so that people can uh, can have more details on what is that exactly is in the content of Dimension uh, and not just us talking about it. Um, we will continue to provide very various webinars to our institution. This fall, our 17 institution will provide, will do what we call a show and tell. They will provide to the rest of the cohort. It was either an initiative that they've done that worked very well, something that they intend to do, or something that they tried and actually didn't work. Uh, and what was the lesson learned in that sense? Um, so we're quite excited because some of some of the institutions have have pretty um, have pretty good idea and pretty good project that are on the go. Um, we'll continue to encourage the collaboration between the institutions um, and uh, provide some uh, tools and templates. Uh, we're working right now on a, um, a database of questions that institution could ask in their in their different uh, questionnaires for for data collection. So so that should help um, some of our institutions that have less resources. So I'll go over this quickly, uh, but next year institutions in the cohort will be able to send an application, we will do the revision, and then we hope that this pilot will continue, of course, after 2023. 
So that's it for now. I'll stop here. I'm sure there's plenty of questions um, that I will be happy to answer. Thank you, Natalie. Um, yeah, I think we can <clears throat> jump straight into the questions. I will go with one in, <clears throat> in the Q&A right now. What specifically about the competitive nature of the DNS-1 prog program raised concerns with Canadian institutions? Um, institution really felt that that EDI should not be in competition, that information should be shared inwards and outward, like I mentioned. Um, often institution, you know, they keep the information to themselves, they're developing something and they want to use this as a competitive edge with, a, with another institution. Um, so the, the institutions in the cohort and often during the consultation process, ins, institution and individuals said that sharing the information so that we don't reinvent the wheels every time should be, uh, should be at the core of dimension. Um, and that's why we, we always encourage institution to don't keep the information for yourself and to really share it with, with, with the others. So that we don't have, so that every institution don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. Uh, because often, and it's not necessarily our fault, but um, uh, institutions don't put a lot of resources on in, in EDI. So often it's a, an EDI coordinator, or uh, sometimes, it's, sometimes it's a director, sometimes it's a higher level, uh, but it's often a small team. So if you have to reinvent the documentation every time, like uh, unconscious bias training or, or things like that, we believe that in, if you had that information uh, on hand, it would be much easier. Um, uh, slightly related to this, because you mentioned that you don't want to reproduce a lot of these uh, these resources. Uh, how can an institution, uh, how can universities who are not affiliated with Dimensions prepare for hopefully the full rollout of the program? Yeah, we'll we'll try to end to uh, release some of the documentation uh, sooner rather than later, so that institution can start preparing. Um, I think it's important for institutions to start gathering the data, um, and you don't need that for you don't need us to do that, uh, especially in the qualitative aspect of it. Uh, so, institutions first of all should have um, some self ID questionnaire when for students for for their staff, uh, and if they can do engagement strategy, that will give them some of the information they need to fill up the application. Um, so we do have some of the tools. Uh, the self-ID questionnaire that the agencies are using is actually on the website. Um, you can, uh, we, can, we can share that information. Um, so as, as soon as we're able to, we will release some of that uh, more detailed information. Perfect. Uh, I do have uh, two small questions. First one, um, could you put back can you share your slides again to show the final slide? I think people were interested in the timeline that you have um, to see the sure. future opportunities. And then another small question is how can institutions sign the charter? So the details are on our website. If you go on Answers website, um, EDI, I, maybe Katie can put it in the chat um, if they can. Um, and uh, they have to fill a form signed by your, it has to be signed by your president. Uh, we, we want it to, to be from the top. So uh, for us, it's really important that um, uh, that the, this commitment comes from the top and then they just send the, the form and uh, we, post, we post it in, in, in a matter of week, um, usually. To go on the schedule, I can, I can actually say it. Um, so institutions, uh, we are finalizing right now the, the draft section, the, the draft handbook uh, and we're, finalizing the recognition scheme system where they, they, for each of the level, we're now looking at four levels instead of three. Institutions um, have commented on the system. They've proposed some uh, very good ideas over the last few months. Um, and uh, institution right now are actually, um, can start filling the application and we will receive the applications hopefully in the next, uh, within a year and then evaluating so that we have uh, an evaluation of our program and our success before the end of the pilot, basically. And we hope that probably in the spring, we will be able to release at least the handbook and some of the documentation so our affiliates can start uh, prepping to send their application uh, in, in the system. We really want, I mean, we really want to see, we consider dimensions as a pilot 
And we really, we have kind of the luxury this time of really treating it as a pilot. Um, so we want to make sure that the system we're putting in place makes sense. Uh, and I know it sounds a bit bizarre because usually we're used to give programs and we should know, but it's it's such a specific way of doing things that we believe that if we spend more time making sure that the system actually really works, it will make it for better results in the long term. So we prefer to take a bit more of our time, uh, but make sure that the system is adapted. So we kind of want to test the system with the cohort. Um, they're really working really hard. Those 17 institutions, um, the program would not be what it is today without their without their um, implication. So we hope we hope that they will receive a recognition. It's not given, um, but um, yeah, the information we're getting is is very valuable. So I guess we don't want to. Uh, you know, s allow institution to come in the system when we haven't tested the system until the end uh, to make sure it, it, it actually makes sense for the, are we asking too much? Are we asking not enough? Uh, the, the, the reaction depends really sometimes on who's looking at the documentation. So the underrepresented groups wants, uh, wants us to ask for more, but of course the higher management, they're like, you're asking too much of us, we can deliver. So, so right, uh, I know it's, it's probably a struggle for many institutions, the resources, the money, the HR, um, and making sure that all this works and gel together within your institution is still a challenge. So we got to respect that also. So there's another question in the Q&A related to this. Yeah. Even if institutions endorse the charter, can departments of that institution also endorse them, endorse the charter? And also, what does it mean for an institution to endorse the charter? Um, so right now, we are focusing on the institution as itself, uh, not uh, not the departments. I know in the UK, uh, there are there is an institutional application and there is a departmental uh, application. Right now, we're just testing the institutional level um, application. So technically, your department, I should not necessarily sign the charter if your if your institution as a whole is already signing it what is what is signing the charter we hope i mean what we want is in, for institutions to actually do, do what it's in the charter uh, we want them to if they're serious about the signing the charter they should collect the data both quantitative and qualitative they should do a self-assessment they should look at their um at their process and starting to look at their policies to make sure that they are uh, more equitable. So there's actually a lot of work that institutions can do uh, before actually entering dimension um, and uh, the details are in the charter. They should do those eight principles um, and abide by it basically. And, you. And, and, and you, the students or the staff should, should make your institution accountable to say, since you signed it, um, what are you going to do? Uh, so they should probably have an EDI plan. The EDI should be in their strategic um, planning. It should there should probably be an EDI page. Um, staff, uh, uh, there should be other resources like for mental health, or um, you can have tools. For example, if you have some trans student who who wants to change their name, um, do you have an inform? Do you have a system in place? You know that that makes sure that these individuals have have an easy path to it. Is the information available? So those are. I mean, I could talk about examples forever, um, but those are maybe could look small, but they're not small uh, initiatives that some of the institutions can do without being in dimension. I would like to point out that Simon Fraser University is one of the participating universities, and we have um, a student who will be joining the student panel at the end, and yes. she may be able to speak more about her experience as a student uh, yeah, part of uh, a EDI committee. Um, coming back to the Q and A questions, um, a question from Yvonne: Students are an essential part of the research ecosystem, particularly yeah. grad students, whom will make up our future systems. How and where are students involved in Dimensions initiatives within their institutions? Were students part of the consultation process? Yeah, we did have students. Um, we, um, we do some events also uh, within a student's organization. 
Uh, we, we tell the institution that they should involve the institution in their engagement strategy. Um, so the students are very well a group that we think institutions should get involved with. Uh, if, if we receive an application and it's, there was no student consultation, um, I can't say for sure, but I would not consider this as, a, uh, as complete. Uh, your stu the students are, when we talk about the leaky pipeline, uh, it, it starts there, right? If, you're, if your students get a bad experience um, when they're studying, the process after that, it, it's tainted, everything is tainted after that. So the students for us is, is actually playing a very important role, for sure. Examples were here today. Uh, on a Saturday, uh, I think it's really important the work that your organization is doing. It's great that you're talking about it with the students uh, because um, I, I think also, to be honest, the students these days they're not letting they're not letting the um, the institutions do the same thing they were doing 20 years ago when I was in university. <laughs> you know, um, I think people are talking more. Uh, they're asking more for our from our institutions and from organizations like ours. And, and I think it's great. Have you observed any difference in over the past year since um, the killing of George Ford, which initiated a lot of more discussions about EDI over the past year? Has, has this, has, is there any change that was reflected in the initiatives that dimensions or institutions have taken on? Yeah, I would say, yeah, for sure. Um, I think there's, first of all, um, institutions are doing and organizations are doing much more in terms of web offer of webinars offer of information session about edi focusing on this issue a lot more uh, but also students are not they're not taking their institution seriously if they're if they're if they're just issuing a statement to say we believe in in in, in equality but then uh, in french we say but since we've put it in you know when the, the the work is not done after you know there's a great statement on your website but then people are calling their institutions now to say look you said that on your website but i don't feel this in my day-to-day -day, um when i'm in school i i still feel like i'm not represented by my management i'm not represented by my professors um so over the last few years i've I've been working on, on EDI for the last four years now. I can, yeah, I would say there's a difference for sure. For the good, I think it's great um, that, uh, that this is happening and, and it's worldwide. I, I participated in panels in the UK and Australia and um, I think everybody kind of had a ha-ha mo moment last year and uh, it was time for sure. Thank you. Another question from the Q&A. Uh, regarding the show and tell, is there an opportunity to share the initiatives, successes, lessons learned with institutions outside of the pilot cohort? Yeah, um, we, we can try to find a way to, to do some kind of report, but um, right now we've built kind of this, this trust within the institutions to make sure that, um, and, and we don't want to break that so that if institutions feel are f feeling that they can release some of that information, we, we can work with them, but it, it has to be the decisions of the institutions before. It would be great. I mean, those are great lessons learned. I, I hope they're going to be good lessons learned. So either we remove some of the identity of these institutions. I don't know. We need to work with those institutions. Um, but yeah, it would be great for sure. Thank you. Um, is there an opportunity to provide input into the handbook? Who contributed to the, this person is also asking who contributed to the handbook development process? Yeah, so how we work right now is um, the cohorts of 17, they, um, they can um, share the information that we share with them. Uh, we have like one or two dimensions contact usually. Uh, but they can share the information with their own institutions. Uh, often their self-assessment team is involved. Um, we are not uh, re releasing that information externally, but once we have uh, a public version of it, uh, we will of course welcome comments. Uh, but right now uh, the cohort is commenting. We have what we call the program design expert committee that sits on it. Um, information of the, those individuals is on our website. Um, and um, so I'd say there's, there's a pretty good variety of people who have seen the, the documentation. Um, 
but uh, we're not receiving any um, comments from the public so far, right now, not yet. Right. Um, if there's elements that you, I don't know, you think should be in it and then you really feel compelled about it, you can send us an email at dimensionzdi at answer um, yeah. um maybe maybe it's not there who knows um i mean i don't think we included everything but um they can send us comments for sure mm -hmm. on the email and maybe one of our volunteers can post an email address to, um, in the chat yeah for sure uh, another question are there events where there is sharing of resources will there be a website that creates resources of leading practices to be adopted and be adapted yeah, I mean, that's that's my dream uh, with Dimension is really to be this this kind of catalyst of the different initiatives uh, and that we could be the one that uh, so our goal really is to have um, some of the initiatives from the institution that we would uh, receive at Dimensions that we were that would build as more of a Dimensions initiative. Because a lot of the time is institution if it was built by SFU, for example, but then it's Université Laval, they don't want to use SFU's documentation. So if we start building um, more um, dimensions material that it's kind of not associated with anybody, we believe that this will be very useful. So that's that's my goal in the long term. Right now, I'm really focusing on just finalizing the material. My staff is working very, very, very hard finalizing those. Um, but I, if we can provide more uh, materials, templates um, to institution, it would be very great. Because those best practices, you know, you can find some, um, but to be honest, you can find some examples uh, in some of the documentation developed by the Canada Research Shares Program on their website. Um, they, have a, they have a complete guide uh, that includes a lot of best practices. Um, the, uh, the organization Universities Canada also have um, a report they did two, three years ago now, they did a big survey and there are also some great um, uh, ideas in there. So I would I would start with those for sure. I, if Thanks. I can find them, I'll, I'll make the link, I'll put the link. Um, there's another question in chat that I like as well. Um, is, is there any intention to open this application process or at least the, uh, the resources and the support that Dimensions provide to other federal departments and since several have signed the Dimensions Charter. And I would also go beyond this and ask about the, the private sector. So a lot of people in academia and STEM fields will transition to outside to the private sector. Is there any um, intention? Yeah, so every, to everything, everything we develop that is approved um, will be on their website for sure. Um, we do work with our, we do work at the federal level with, with the other departments to try to develop some of common tools, uh, especially between the departments that are doing uh, research, like the Natural Research, research Council, um, Environment Canada, or um, Natural Resources. Um, so, um, yeah, and, and I know if we can provide all those templates online would be great. I would say also that probably um, there's another initiative uh, that was led by Industry Canada, well, Industry Science and Economic Development, I think it's the name of the department now. Um, uh, it's called the 5030 initiative or 5030 challenge. So I know they're going to post some resources there, but um, I mean, we, we're, we're, we're working with public money. So there's no reason why we would keep that information to ourselves. Uh, if we can uh, release as much information, we will we'll do it for sure. Thanks. Um, another question in the q and I think the community is addressed by dimensions is comprehensive, but what about the inclusion of socioeconomic classes? I think that is an important component of intersectionality. I would also extend this to talk about the difference between the dimensions in at the federal funding agencies and those at the provincial ones, where at the provincial one, there's additional dimension. Can you talk more about um, the choices that you've made to identify the, these different groups? Um, yeah, we always say uh, those groups, but not limited to uh, in the sense that I think 
we're trying to already we were not just focusing on women in STEM and 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 for a lot of years that was the only group that they were focusing in other countries uh, and it's probably there was a reason because it's it's quite comprehensive already. Um, I think institution if 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 they're smart uh, but if they can also they will focus on other aspect um, because it, it's all inter 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 intersected I guess. Um, because yeah, I mean, we talk about first generation students. Uh, that's that's often a challenge. Uh, some of those individuals they start, but then they 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 they, they leave because they feel the system is not adapted to them. Um, so when we talk about the context specific of an institution, um, I think that the economic reality of that region or the and, and their students is is for sure a, a big real a big um, a big aspect to it especially at the college level. So for the colleges that, it is, that are in, in the cohort, the, the economic aspect uh, comes up every time, every time we talk about it. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I would say languages, it's also a very important um, aspect, as you probably heard, I, I have a French accent. So for me, the, um, the importance of those linguistic minorities is very important. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, we chose, we chose the, I mean, what we chose the, the five, the four groups that were in the equity act, the federal equity act, and we added the LGBTQ2 plus communities, but there's no reason maybe in the future where we would add more groups to, to dimension. But I think right now we're, we're going to focus on those for now. Um, there's a, no. Quick question, I think about what incentives do institutions have other than recognition in signing and participating in the program? Yeah, I'd say that having, um, yeah, I mean, the recognition is really, it's the cherry on the Sunday, to be honest. I think institutions should all do uh, what Dimensions is requesting and, and the recognition is really, it, it, it's a star, but I mean, you should not do it just because you want this recognition. You should do the work because you think it's important. Um, so I guess that's that's the difference I, that we will see between some of the application is that were were they in dimension because they wanted uh, they wanted it for the right reason or not, um, basically. And um, I think also when we're going to provide more uh, material. But, but this mutuality and this exchange of information, I hope it's going to be created organically without necessarily dimension. But I think we, if we can be that catalyst, we keep repeating that all the time. Um, it, it, that's where we're going to see the power of dimension. And maybe to answer the following question fairly quickly, because I think I know the answer. Does the data collection sharing also includes how many faculty and leadership roles are represented? Are, represented by the communities the program is intended to serve. You're asking about faculty and leadership roles, whether this is uh, uh, included in the data collection process. Yeah, yeah, they should, yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, but again, it's just not the numbers. I mean, I think what a lot of institution or a lot of groups are thinking, what, when are you gonna be happy? You know, do I need 25%, do I need 50? It's like the, the vaccines, right? Uh, when are you gonna be happy? But at the same time is, are you, are you changing your institution or your lab? Or are you just recruiting black students because you think you need that number? That's not the goal. Nobody wants to be hired just because of their differences, right? We want, yeah. so I think once you have, uh, when you understand this is that you, you're making sure that everybody, once they are in, they're welcome and, and, and they can flourish as much as anybody else. That's what people want. Um, I will be the first one. I don't want to be hired just because I'm a woman. I want to be hired and I want to receive the same treatment as my as my other colleague. So that's important. Just for, for time, I'd like to ask one final question. Can yeah. you give us um, a final uh, recommendation of what people can do who are not part of the Dimensions pilot program right now? What can they actively do to either um, be included in the program in the future or to still support their local communities? Yeah, I'd say you need to, as, uh, as students in your institution, you need to ask your institution, what are they doing for EDI? 
uh, and and not them let not that let them uh, just give you a border plate. Yeah, yeah, ADI is important for us, but then if you don't have any resources, you need to challenge your institutions to to give you that. So, as as students, you got to have your eyes open on 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 what your institution is doing and. Uh, if you're feeling some harassment, you need to report it. Uh, if your institution that doesn't have a reporting system, ask for it. You know, you need to ask those questions um, and uh, and encourage your institution if they have not done so to sign the charter, but also to put to put some of the resources to make sure that the principles are put in place. You have a big role. The students are the ones that are making those institutions live. If there's no students in the universities, there's no university. If there's no students in the college, there's no college. So the students have the power to make sure that the success of this is happening. Uh, so yeah, you have actually a very big role to play. That's perfect. Um, I think that's a great ending point for this session. Um, we're slightly over time. Um, thank you a lot, um, Natalie, for the presentation and for the discussion as well to, to answer all the discussions we have in our, from our audience. Um, at this point, I'd like to remind folks that um, the next session of today's um, entire workshop is the actual workshop session, which will take place at 12.15, so in slightly less than 15 minutes. Um, for everyone who's registered to either the entire event or the uh, workshop session, you should have received an email. Um, we can still post the link here for those interested. So this will be held in a separate Zoom meeting link because it's going to be interactive and there will be um, breakout rooms. The rest of the um, events today, so notably the panel discussions in the afternoon, um, will take place in this same Zoom webinar link. So uh, you can return to this later on. So again, thank you everyone for your participation and the discussions. Um, we will see you either at 12.15 in a workshop link or um, back again at, I believe, 2.15 PM Eastern time. Thank it's you. It's a fun workshop. You should do it. You, know, you, want, you don't want to miss it. All right, thank you. Okay, so on my clock now, it's 2.15 Eastern time. So I'd like to take a moment to welcome everyone back to our afternoon sessions. Uh, my name is Caitlin Eason, and I am a PhD student in neuroscience at McGill University and a science and policy exchange volunteer. Joining you from Chojage, or Montreal, located on the traditional unceded territory of the Gagne Gahaga Nation. It's my great pleasure to moderate today's panel of expert EDI practitioners. We've gathered a great group of experts from different perspectives to discuss current best practices, strategies, and challenges to EDI initiatives in Canadian academic and research institutions. We will begin the panel with some pre-planned discussion questions for the panelists. However, at the end of the session, there will be time dedicated to questions from the audience. So I encourage you all um, to add any questions that you'll have for the panelists using the Q&A feature, which you can access at the bottom of your screen. And you'll also have the chance to vote on questions that are submitted by other um, attendees. So that way we can prioritize questions that uh, a lot of people are interested in. Um, so without further ado, let's meet our panelists. Um, to our panelists, I'd like one at a time each of you to take a few moments to introduce yourself, including your experience in EDI initiatives and what you're currently working on in the EDI space. Um, so perhaps we could start with our first panelist, Jocelyn Baker. Uh, hello, yes, my name is Jocelyn Baker and I'm speaking uh, with you today from the Niagara region of Southern Ontario, Canada. 
the Niagara region is covered by the Treaty at Niagara and is within the land protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. This agreement extends all the way from Montreal, Quebec, uh, down through Lake Erie uh, at the uh, far end of the Niagara region. And it asks to take only what you need and leave the rest for everybody else. The Niagara region is a traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples, and we are directly who are directly responsible for the great standard of living that is afforded uh, to us, uh, to me today. And this great opportunity uh, includes uh, my uh, recent privilege to return to university, uh, Brock University down here in Niagara, to complete a master's degree in sustainability science. And I am a 2020 uh, pandemic graduate, uh, which is odd um, um, because my son is also a 2020 graduate and he's 13. Um, <laughs> we share that. I've been working as a researcher since um, that time with Dr. Liette Vesseur. She is the president for the Canadian Commission for UNESCO and also um, the, uh, chairholder for UNESCO from sustainability local to global it, with emphasis on um, research, looking at removing EDI barriers for women in STEM and for traditionally excluded uh, peoples in academic institutions. We just research, uh, released some research um, about that, uh, just came out yesterday, and I think you'll get the links as part of this workshop. But prior to this, I worked in natural resource uh, management for over 25 years, and often as the only female um, during my undergraduate coursework and in my early career, I certainly um, have experienced uh, inequities, discrimination, and sexism, uh, both in the classroom and in the work environment. And these experiences have played a role, um, a positive role um, in uh, my decision to sort of change the, the trajectory of my career and, and come back to university uh, and pursue um, my master's degree and being able to take some of those very difficult um, situations and time of my life and being able to uh, put it to better use in terms of uh, you know, helping to contribute to this much needed ongoing EDI dialogue, um, looking at solutions and, um, you know, the, the good practices through our research and those things we're going to be talking about in today's workshop. So I thank you for the opportunity. Thanks so much, Jocelyn. Um, next up, we have Nancy Hansen. Hi, my name is Nancy Hansen. I'm coming to you from Winnipeg, which is uh, the Treaty One Territory, traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, uh, Ojibwe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dene, and Dakota peoples, the birthplace of the Metis Nation and the heartland of uh, the Metis Nation's homeland. I, I won't call myself an expert in EDI. However, I have a lived EDI experience. I, I feel very uncomfortable with the term expert because it, it assumes that you know everything, and I know I don't know everything. So. I am a, a disabled woman. I use crutches for mobility. I am the director and um, uh, professor from the University of Manitoba Interdisciplinary Master's Program in Disability Studies. I'm on the Dimensions Advisory Committee on uh, EDI issues. Currently, um, I'm on the, the um, EDI Committee for my union. I'm on the EDI for the Dean of Graduate Studies at the University of Manitoba. And I've been involved with um, uh, various community groups working on uh, um, disabled, disabled people's concerns around medical assistance in dying and uh, the current uh, pandemic approach to people with disabilities. But there, there's an EDI element to all of this. And I'm very uh, privileged and proud to be here today. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Nancy. Um, next up, uh, Corrine Morin, could you please take a few minutes to introduce yourself? Yes, pleasure to be with everyone this afternoon, joining from Ottawa, which is the unceded uh, territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe. So sitting on the uh, shores of the Great River, the Kitchissippi, uh, which pretty much links Canada from east to west, not quite all the way north, but um, I'm, um, <laughs> I'm not an expert, but even much less so than Nancy Hansen, and I've been learning uh, from her quite a bit. My own background is actually in law uh, and bioethics, um, and I came to EDI just two years ago, essentially joining NSERC 
um, and being presented with this incredible opportunity to lead a tri-agency EDI action plan. So it 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 um, it, it, it uh, involves NSERC, but also social sciences and humanities research council, Canadian Institutes of Health Research, CHR. And um, that makes me the lucky person in charge of the Dimensions program, which we've been uh, talking about earlier today. Um, pleasure to be with all of you. Thanks so much. Um, next up, we have Andrzej Tarasowski. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrzej Tarasowski. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. Uh, I'm joining as well from uh, Jojake or Montreal, uh, which is on the unceded territory of the Ganyanga uh, First Nations, who are the rightful stewards of the lands and waters from which I joined. Um, so my background is actually decidedly not in the sciences, uh, but rather in the humanities. I did my PhD in music composition and um, my early uh, work within EDI uh, as a whole uh, stems from uh, founding and, and running a, as artistic director of a music festival in Waterloo, Ontario. Uh, and there we really developed that, that program, which is called uh, WRCMS, um, with a very strong focus on underrepresented uh, voices within contemporary classical music. Uh, and so that was a very uh, enlightening experience for me uh, in a lot of ways, because no matter how, uh, how much I, I think to echo Nancy's point, nobody's an expert really. There's always going to be gaps. There's always going to be areas where you can uh, do better. I'm currently, uh, so I found myself in the sciences somewhat surprisingly, I, I guess. I'm currently the equity and training program officer for Healthy Brains, Healthy Lives, uh, which is an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary neuroscience program at McGill University, uh, which primarily uh, funds researchers and trainees, and which itself is a, a grant funded program supported by CFREF. Um, so my work really focuses on around um, uh, making sure that uh, our funding is has equitable distribution and that we're um, providing training opportunities, including EDI training opportunities uh, for our community so that we can do better for the next generation uh, neuroscientists. Pleasure to meet everyone. Thanks so much. Um, and finally, we have uh, Jessica Vandenberg. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Jessica Vandenberg. My pronouns are she, her. I'm joining from the traditional territory of Treaty 6 in Métis Nation Zone Number 4 here in Edmonton, Alberta. Um, my journey, I am born from the Dene Ta First Nation, but I'm a 60 scoop survivor, so I was put into the adoption foster system. Um, I found my way to Edmonton, to the University of Alberta, where I completed two engineering degrees, and I went out to work in industry. Um, I worked as a senior research engineer for a large oil sands company for about 10 years and a variety of director positions after that uh, for APEGA, which is our engineering regulator in Alberta. And then I work as an Indigenous community consultant because I felt a calling to um, give back to Indigenous communities and, and start uh, understanding um, that birth heritage that I have, as well as how we can contribute as professionals to truth and reconciliation. So I worked as an Indigenous community consultant for a couple of years. And now I sit um, with the University of Alberta as the Assistant Dean of Engineering, Community and Culture, really working towards shifting um, towards uh, a more inclusive place, working towards equitable, fr equitable frameworks, um, bringing light and awareness to truth and reconciliation and how we can all contribute to the calls to action. I am also a mother of two. Um, and uh, as a professional engineer, um, a lot of what I do towards for EDI is uh, to pave uh, an, an easier path for my children, um, depending whatever career they go into. Because often I find myself the only one of my type in the room, whether it is uh, at the intersection of uh, female gender or um, as an indigenous person as well. So there's a lot of work to be done to shift the cultures and some of the mindsets and some of the very old governance and policies that exist. So uh, I do sit on a number of EDI boards, um, EDI and Truth and Reconciliation um, are both part of my portfolios uh, in my job, as well as I, I do have a side consultancy firm as well, where we walk with communities and organizations that wanna work um, more effectively with indigenous peoples and communities and come with a, a true understanding of what that means. So that's a bit about me. It's a pleasure to be here and I, I look forward to the discussion.
Thanks, Jessica. And thanks for all of our panelists for taking the time to join us here today and lend your experience to us. I'm really looking forward to the discussions that we're going to be having. Um, so to start off, I was hoping we could talk to first about identifying where the gaps are in EDI actions within higher education. And specifically, our first question for the panelists is this. In what in your opinion, what specific aspects of higher education, whether it be hiring procedures or retention and support for faculty and students, are most in need of inter targeted intervention to improve equity, diversity, and inclusion? And as an extension to this, do you think these important areas tend to be included in or overlooked by typical institutional action plans? And why do you think that is? So maybe to get the ball rolling, we could start with Jocelyn. Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, you know, they're, they're all important areas and, and they all, um, they all work together uh, to pick just one. Um, and this is further supported by uh, the research that just actually went, went live yesterday. Um, we certainly need to do a better job of getting more diversity into decision-making roles, um, especially for Canadian uh, universities, but also uh, public and business sectors as well. Everything we're going to be talking about today is transferable to other sectors and just not the academy. Uh, we know that that men, um, white men in particular, dominate these these top administration uh, positions, full professorship um, uh, on committees, on board positions as chairs of these committees. So in these decision making roles, we have a, a dominant perspective. Um, and you know affinity bias there's lots of different biases you know we spin the wheel pick your bias but affinity bias that's a preference for likeness and sameness so when you, when you have these decision makers that all look the same and think the same you know um you know if it was a soup it would be broth not very interesting not very diver diverse in fact it's probably beige and quite boring um, so it, it makes it very difficult for other genders and races and just uh, ways of knowing and thinking um, you know, to make it through these other these other areas as mentors, um, you know, there's underrepresentation there in networking. We know that um, you know men get more opportunities, um, and uh, you know it it's going to be difficult to break this cycle. Um, so how do we do that? Um, you know, we certainly need to pay attention to gendered language um, uh, in recruitment processes, letters of reference how we're networking, um, gendered language is, is quite a significant barrier. That was something that in our research, um, you know, I knew it was there, but it really allowed me um, to look at how I was even impacted it by it um, and, and become more informed. So we need to check that, we need to check our biases. Um, and uh, another important aspect is just changing the criteria of how we are defining research excellence. Um, you know, we need to move away from the antiquated way of, of just looking at citations and publishing volume, because again, it favors men. And, um, you know, that doesn't necessarily determine who is the best candidate. So a lot of this comes down to awareness of what the actual barriers, you know, what are the real issues here? And, um, and is there a will for change? And that will for change, I think, will come from a better level of, of um, being informed. Um, do these areas, uh, do, do we want to go to the second part of the question or do we want to wait? Yeah, till you can everybody... jump right in if you want. <laughs> do these uh, areas tend to be included or overlooked in institutional action plans? Um, action plans, policies, procedures, these are all important uh, EDI components um, and you know they will not solve the problems alone. Uh, I, I think that you know in our research we looked at the research level because it, it, this, it can be so high level and so top down that there's a disconnect at the lower level. And so our research actually <clears throat> took a bottom up approach starting in the research laboratory and um, the grassroots sort of movement of what individual researchers and students can do. And hopefully that top down, that bottom up will meet somewhere along the way for better alignment. So, um, you know, there are importance, but they won't do it in isolation. We need all of these things working. We need to be working at all of these things in, in at the same time. Thank you. Nancy, I see you have your hand up. Do you want to jump in? Yes, please. Um, I think 
in general, the the academy is still very uncomfortable with any kind of difference, however it's framed. Um, if I and if I can just touch on right now that nobody's just one thing, right? I think we have to look at this from a very intersectional approach in that some parts of our identities come to the fore at certain times, but we're, we're none of us are just one thing. But I, again, I would say that the academy is very uncomfortable with any form of difference because they've had this very um, old fashioned template in place for hundreds and hundreds of years. At the present time, they've been going after the low hanging fruit, the easy option, if you will, looking at language, um, having endless focus groups and you know reports. And none of those really, to this point anyway, have amounted um, to very much. But there, there's the impression that things are being done um, because of all these meetings and reports and focus groups, but nothing really changes. And I think we have to really take a serious look at um, policies, programs, and systems within the academy that those of us who are impacted on most by it have had nothing to do with it in the first place in, in its development. And um, a lot of times the myths and misconceptions around these various marginalities uh, provide the impetus for the way that policies are developed. And those of us, as I said, who are most impacted by it are find ourselves in the midst of this stuff and we're expected to fix it. A program that um, systemically disenfranchises various groups um, and we are the most impacted and we have to fix it. We're expected to fix things all the time. And there's very, um, it sort of gives, um, absolution to the academy because those people are going to deal with it whereas and the academy has a kind of tick box mentality of checking off things that have been dealt with without really um looking at the framework and and having the difficult conversations and that's what i think we have to, we have to start to do have the difficult conversations and we have to look at diversity in all its forms as a possibility rather than a problem. That's where we have to shift. Thanks, Nancy. I really liked what you said there at the end about possibilities and not problems. I think that's a great way to shift the way that the institutions are thinking about it as a box to check off rather than and instead looking at it in a way that these are steps we can take to improve our institution and have solutions to make it a better place for everyone. So thank you for adding that comment. Um, Jessica, perhaps you'd jump, like to jump in with some of your experiences in, as a university faculty member? For sure, definitely. Um, and what Jocelyn and Nancy both said resonate quite a bit. Uh, a lot of it does come down to the governance system that was built hundreds and hundreds of years ago in a time um, where it was white uh, male dominated, so quite sexist, quite racist. Um, but it's something that, again, it takes um, a lot of um, the right leadership in the right positions in order to want to change that because it's a complex system that needs to be changed with the fund, uh, grant funders, research funders, needs to be changed with the unions, it needs to be changed with the attitudes, um, and it, it does affect everybody. And when ego gets tied into it, um, then of course, uh, um, those who are tenured professors uh, don't really want to see that change. Um, so the, the biggest thing that is lacking, I would say, is this is, is one of the seven sacred teachings of humility, um, the humility of, of wanting to um, change for the better good, to make the culture better, to make the culture more inclusive, to make it equitable to underrepresented groups. Um, but also, even just in the teaching style, where um, professors um, are essentially expected to know everything about that subject matter area. And so um, having to keep up this perception of, of having to know everything in a certain subject matter area um, works against this idea of humility. And so is there a different way to teach um, the Indigenous um, ways of knowing, being, doing, and relating are really founded on um, these seven sacred teachings on this idea of interconnectedness, on this idea that you only take what you need, which is in contradiction to how um, our world is built with capitalism and, and wanting to uh, work for your own and gather as much as you need um, rather than sharing, 
right? And, and sometimes you see that in research areas too, because within the governance system, it's built very competitive. So you're, you're fighting rather than wanting to share the knowledge, um, you're trying to be the expert in that knowledge and hoard that knowledge um, rather than disseminating it and, and wanting everybody to come to a common understanding. So there's, there's a lot that stands in the, in the way, um, but definitely um, it is hard to change a system where you're trying to attract underrepresented demographic groups and, and you know, present this perception that yes, you know, um, say for engineering, because I'm an, an engineer, um, that it's, you know, it's a great profession, you can be creative in it, you can make social impact, and then you bring them into a faculty um, and university culture um, that contradicts that, where inclusivity isn't always quite what it should be, and the examples uh, and case studies and, and the things shared within classes aren't always um, um, as inclusive as it could be. And then we put them out into industry where uh, sometimes the company culture is even worse. So it's, it's a multifaceted problem that needs the right leaders in the right positions to all have a drive and a motivation to want to make um, the right change that needs to happen. Thanks for that, Jessica. That's a really good point that one of the really big things that we're going to have to change about academia is just the culture as a whole, that competitive nature that doesn't really allow people to be humble and to learn and to seek to improve. And I think it ties back into what Nancy said about the low hanging fruit, which is often what higher edu education institutes look for. They're just putting together these focus groups without actually accepting and having the humility to learn from what they're learning from those focus groups to actually move that into concrete change. And I think that's something that is really going to have to change going forward. Um, and speaking of which, I think we'll move into the next question, which goes from identifying these gaps to preparing for action and actually preparing to produce the changes that come from these discussions. Um, and for this, um, I'd specifically like to talk about stakeholder consultation and its importance. Um, in particular, it's a very important part of developing institutional action plans, consulting the groups that these action plans are aiming to improve the lives of, which could include university faculty and students from underrepresented groups. Um, from your experience, do you have any recommendations for best practices and approaches for appropriately accomplishing stakeholder consultations? And this perhaps could be any um, successes or challenges from your personal experience. I see Nancy has a hand up right away. Uh, yes, um, I, in that I think um, there's a lot of um, cons consultation fatigue uh, in within the academy on both sides of the desk, right? Because it's so much easier to con uh, consult people than actually do something, right? We have to start having a substantive action done as opposed to planning to do it. I swear we could be in the next millennium before anything gets done, right? Because there's a perception within the academy uh, that they uh, that everybody there already knows everything, right? And their job is to impart knowledge and they're very, a lot of them are very comfortable with the privilege they have. And I'm speaking as a, a four-legged, I, I refer to myself as a four-legged woman, but I'm a four-legged white woman who's cis with privilege, otherwise I wouldn't be there because I can sort of uh, maneuver around uh, environments that never expect me to be there in the first place. So if anybody with any kind of difference shows up, you're either exceptional and you're definitely unexpected. And that's, that's not the way it should be. And so there's a lot of disconnect between all, with all these processes going on because there's so few, uh, individuals that have been able to work through all the hoops that they're consulted all the time and again it absolves the um the larger institution from doing anything right it's not seen as a natural part of the process so we have to put um an edi lens on every policy that we develop not the ones that are just directed for those people right and there seems to be a still a, an artificial dividing line between us, whoever us is, and them, whoever they are. And I think that there has to be a, a serious um, a, um, rebuilding and uh, um, um, taking apart 
of the policies that are there before we can do anything. And again, don't frame the conversations as difficult, but conversations that must be had if we're going to do anything realistic to change things rather than look like we're changing things. Thanks for that, Nancy. I, I agree. It's a very important way in the way we approach these consultations. Um, I'd love to get some input on this question from people maybe on the other side of the conversations. Perhaps we could go to Anjay and you could talk about how the Healthy Brains for Healthy Lives initiatives takes these points of views into developing their action, their EDI actions. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, I think right off the bat, I, I really think Nancy hit it on the head to say that there's consultation fatigue. Um, I think it's really important to remember, you know, consultation is also, I'll just say a, a bit of a loaded word um, when, when you're meeting with these groups, just want to recognize that. But um, it's often persons who are affected by inequities who are often called upon to do the labor uh, of, of, you know, sort of getting to a place that's more equitable. Um, and so stakeholder, you know, consultation, to use that maybe somewhat problematic word, uh, is really essential. I mean, you, you can't take action in a silo. You do need to, um, you, you do need to communicate and, and have uh, perspectives coming from, from uh, persons affected by this. Uh, so and I think especially, for example, in the last year, um, you know, there's been uh, a lot of social and political uh, mobilization uh, around, uh, in particular, let's say in, in the Canadian context, uh, uh, around Indigenous uh, peoples, around um, it, within the North American context, uh, around uh, Black people. And there has to be some recognition that when, when there is that kind of um, social mobilization, there is that consultation fatigue because they, these people are being called upon to consult with so many groups. You know, you're, you're one of many emails that, that, um, that their people are getting all the time, but it is an essential part of the process. And so I think around best practices, I think right off the bat, I would say one best practice is to be prepared to actually make tangible action. Again, to echo Nancy's point, it can't just be a, a conversation. It's a really great starting place. Um, you also have to recognize that it is labor that's involved with this. And that means paying people for their consultation, um, you know, uh, that's that's a really really important part of that uh and you have to come prepared you have to be humble because no matter how prepared you think you are or no matter how much you know how comfortable you are with something you have to be prepared to learn you have to be prepared to take action um you have to focus not on what you are doing already or what you have done but what you can do that's that's the purpose uh, of the consultation uh and so you know there's challenges uh in in a lot of ways in every step of that that way because Again, it comes down to that labor that's involved. You have to be willing to do that labor uh, if you're consulting with the group. And that's that's a big part of coming prepared to a conversation. Uh, you can't expect people to understand the purview of, of your institution's mandate and, and what you're trying to achieve uh, within that you know, short hour or two long conversation. Uh, you, you, know, you provide an overview, but you have to come prepared and say, these are the things that we're ready to, to act upon uh, you know, these are, but we also want to get more stakeholder consultation. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say around the best practices component of that is um, be really mindful when you are reaching out uh, to people, uh, you know, be very considerate that, you know, again, you're one of many, many emails um, that, that people are wanting to reach out to. And so, uh, you know, don't write very long emails, very short to the point, um, you know, understand, understand that um, again comes down to labor this is labor that's involved this is labor that you're asking people to do so yeah i'll let others uh, add to that i think the, the perspective i'll take here is a little bit in terms of the dimensions program itself and how it has been evolving so um i uh, worry if i repeat a little bit what's been said before but um in developing the program we did start with consultations um, and we sort of did the government typical consultation, uh, go to the big stakeholders, uh, do it quick. And what we heard and what we listened to was that uh, beware of that quick and fast perfunctory consultation. Um, and instead, we added a second round. I would still consider them to have been consultations, 
Um, so staff were on the road visiting 17 different institutions um, and much more diversity of point of views as to what the program, uh, how, how the program um, should really be tailored to Canadian realities, et cetera, et cetera. I would still consider that to have been very much on the consultation sort of level. I think what we're really now engaged in as a program is engaging, and it's with a smaller group. It's the cohort of 17 institutions that we're working with really closely. And now we're referring to co-developing the Dimensions program with those 17 institutions. So now we're really engaged with them. Now we've sort of come from it saying, we as funders know something about the research ecosystem, the financial support to it, um, but we don't really know all that well how it uh, all sort of flows through universities or colleges as well in the Dimensions program. So we're really drawing on, on the expertise of the institutions to give us an understanding of what is realistic expectations and what are their aspirations and how far can we reach through uh, what may have been presented this morning, again, a sort of uh, levels of, of bringing about EDI changes. So that engagement in the co-development to me is illustrative of why I think we do expect institutions themselves to be doing um, as they are going to be preparing applications for dimensions rec recognition. We've really said to them, you have got to go out there and hear the stories of the lived experiences. And we wanna hear what you've heard. We want that those voices to come through in the application. So we are looking for hopefully some applications that have a lot more in terms of narratives of what is, what is it that is uh, to be brought down? What is the races and the discriminations? What are the barriers that have been identified that uh, the scientists of these different um, underrepresented groups, marginalized groups um, have been experiencing, once you admit to it, so once we hear about it, then we can truly try and address it. So it is a matter of trying to establish that, um, uh, starting from, from the realities. And the reality is that we don't have perfectly equitable and fair processes. So let's hear directly uh, from those who how it is that they experience it and how it can be changed. So to me, the engagement that will be called upon on the institutions will be uh, very much ongoing. So the dimensions process is sort of expecting, yes, there'll be applications that will be sent in, um, but the work will continue. And if institutions want to come back some years later, demonstrating that they've really progressed uh, over to a next level of, of, of change in EDI, they will have had to sustain that engagement um, they will have had to respond back and account for and report and make transparent what actions have taken place and what needs to uh, be worked on some more. So to me, engagement is a, the ongoing process of um, trying to bridge the us and them administration and uh, faculty or students um, and bring the togetherness of, of doing the work. So just sort of bring that perspective and drawing a little bit on how we've developed the program itself, the Dimensions program itself perhaps as some inspiration to what institutions may be doing. Thanks, Karina. I like what you said about engagement, and I think maybe taking away with from our full discussion on this question is moving away from the idea of a, a quick and fast stakeholder consultation, which might seem like a box to check, but moving towards continued involving engagement with the people that we're meeting, we're hoping to improve the experiences of. So I really liked what everyone's contributed to this question. Um, so, so far, I think we've seen that we have panelists here today from different perspectives, representing different positions within the higher education ecosystem, and having people from different perspectives like university faculty, university administrators and program officers, EDI researchers and funding agencies, there's these interactions that are really important to driving forward EDI action. So for my next question, I'd like to focus on kind of the structure of these collaborations. Um, and ask the panelists if you could describe some successes and challenges that you might have had with engaging and working with practitioners from different um, perspectives or positions within the research ecosystem. Um, maybe we can start with Jessica for this one. For sure, thank you. Definitely there is a lot of challenges. So, so maybe I'll start with that and then end on the more positive note of uh, some of the successes. So definitely challenges, um, often the conversation still um, starts at like, why is this an issue? Why are we talking about this? Why is EDI important? Um, why is truth and reconciliation important? 
um, because for many people, it's still quite divided in, uh, in their heads that this is a separate thing from the things that they're doing. Um, but in actuality, EDI and TRC should be a foundational thing across everything. Um, it's important because we all live together. We work in institutions that are international. Um, and because a, lot, a large portion of our student population is international, we need to have an understanding around all the different demographics, whether you divide that and categorize it by gender or, or race or whatever your category is gonna be. Um, there's a lot of intersections. And in order to fully serve the student body, to fully have researchers um, be successful in um, research that is truly EDI, we need all that training that needs to happen there. So um, really moving along the conversation around, it is important for everyone. Um, and for us as professional engineers, um, all our faculty, um, they have to hold their professional engineering license. It ties directly to ethical behavior which is part of the code of ethics that we sign off to, to hold our professional license. So there are some strong lines of, of why it's important and that needs to be understood that it's not a separate thing from what you're doing. It is part of everything that you should be doing. Um, the other piece of it, um, some of the biggest challenges is when people in leadership positions don't understand that. Um, and so for the best successes, of course, is when people in those leadership positions understand EDI and truth and reconciliation and they live and breathe it and they naturally role model it in their meetings, in their um, programs that they, um, they build, the events, the initiatives. And EDI um, is incorporated into everything from event management, um, space setup, lab setup, PPE, safety, um, to um, consultation with communities that you're working with. And again, this proper consultation we're talking about as well today, um, as well as uh, how to measure it. But the biggest important part um, that needs to be built in that is a challenge is accountability. Um, and so even though researchers um, apply for grants and things like that, and there's a section for EDI, there's not always the follow-up to say, well, have you actually implemented that? And there's not always a tie back to your annual performance review saying, well, okay, what did you do? And well, if you didn't do anything, well, that's gonna affect your performance review. There needs to be the accountability tie back. Um, when it comes to consultation um, with underrepresented groups and, and different demographics, um, the biggest thing is to make sure that it's fair and transparent. Where I see a lot of consultation fall down is that the underrepresented groups, um, Anjay did a good job talking about the idea of tokenism, not always relying on the same um, um, marginalized groups of people, um, but some of everybody to spread it around, this idea of tokenism. But um, it's important to do the follow-up afterwards. So really explain what uh, the consultation is for, um, when are they gonna hear back, and then be really fair and transparent in the we're listening report that will come back to those who were consulted with. Because often um, I see that um, falling down in that area too, that uh, you know, you'll pick and choose what you wanna hear from the consultation and put it in your report to, to make it um, lean towards where you went ahead, right? But you can still do a proper consultation summary report saying, you know, we heard these good things and we heard these negative things. And we used all that and we made our decision. And this is why um, these aspects of it weren't included. So just being more fair and transparent in, in the reporting back is, is an important part of it. Um, and then the last kind of uh, success method that I will mention, just because I, I know uh, just keeping an eye on time, is that um, consultation doesn't have to always be traditional email out a survey, email out a survey. There are many different ways to consult. Um, there are focus groups. Um, I'm a fan of sharing circles. Uh, I use sharing circles in so many things because then you capture the introverted people as well because they get their time and space and you give them as much time and space as they need. Um, you have social media now as a different way of consultation, gathering all the opinions and comments that people uh, freely make um, on some of those platforms um, and gathering that all together to be part of it. And of course, the traditional one on one interviews are, are always good too. But um, really, um, thinking through multiple ways uh, in order to the, do the consultation. And again, if you do choose the email survey method, really having someone look through a gender-based analysis lens on the survey questions. And I think about 
some of the surveys that I've seen done where uh, the survey is very much geared towards an end goal that, that is already decided upon um, versus actually truly gathering the voice of a, of a group of people. So um, those are the thoughts I wanted to share on this one. Thanks. Thank you, Jessica. I wanted to add in um, an important group within the higher um, education ecosystem that could, can and should play a role in advancing EDI action is students. And we have a lot of students here today. So for our last full question, I wanted to ask um, all or any of the panelists to describe what they see the role of students being in advancing EDI measures at academic institutions. This can either be students in internal institutional based organizations or nationwide external organizations. So we can start with Nancy. Yes, students can be fantastic allies, right? I mean, well informed allies spread the load of the work you have to do because a lot of times I, I can speak as a visibly disabled woman if a non dis if a non-visibly disabled student is promoting something, they're seen as less as a, shall we say, a crip with a chip on their shoulder. They're, they're seen as um, being um, open and, and unbiased in any way. So I think, uh, and that works for other uh, non-visible, non visible, more regularized faculty, if you will, the more well-informed allies people have for whatever uh, systemically marginalized group that you're in or group that you're in, um, there's less of a, a demand on those who are, are directly involved and it, it regularizes the conversation too. I think we have to regularize and naturalize this type of conversation. And the more, the more students become aware of what's um, what's actually out there, the more, um, the more well-rounded life skills they'll have too. So it has a lot of advantages for everybody. So I think st students as well-informed allies, as well as faculty, it's priceless. And I'm not just saying that because there's a bunch of students out there. I agree. I think there's so much that students can bring to the table. And I think what we're hoping to do today is encourage some of the students in attendance to really put their feet on the ground, do, do some work and get involved in this. Do any of the other panelists have thoughts on student involvement in EDI action? Kareem? Uh, certainly. Uh, so I think we've um, been talking about the leaky pipeline uh, problem and, and how uh, at different stages of career, we lose some of the population that we see in the ranks of the undergraduates. So the, diverse, the Canadian diversity is in the post-secondary institutions and then it's lost, it doesn't reach as so I think I'd call on students um, just to be really vocal. If at some point you are facing that, what seems to be insurmountable barrier, everyone needs to hear it and has to confront that that is the barrier that is possibly preventing you from continuing on. And I think we just have to expose that and hear it and talk about it and not just sort of feel like I have to be silent on my choice of not pursuing because it may be perceived as defeat uh, abandoning, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there are unfortunately really troubling connotations of certain choices being made, but I think we have to expose the, the, the pressures. We have to, uh, everyone who seems to think that it is acceptable to have certain types of expectations of work-life balance, we have to call it out. The students um, have to just really be the voice, the conscience, and you're strong in numbers, <laughs> way more undergraduate students, more graduate students than there are administrators. So just speaking out will really help expose and bring some recognition that it is really puzzling to me as a non-scientist why this activity has to be 24-7. Um, I understand that some things in labs may occur at nighttime, but I'm perplexed, frankly. I'm just perplexed. So call it out and, and let's try and bring that culture change. Thanks. I think Anjay, you had your hand up next. Yeah, I think I think to build on that, um, I think Karen, you really hit, hit it on the head there. Uh, I think there's something to be said for the the, the people who are in positions of power, um, which is what, fundamentally what it, what this comes down to. They already think that things are fair and equitable because they got to where they are, um, and so you know, students in a lot of ways, um, I, I feel like they 
at least from my perspective, when I was a student, there's this perception of like, well, I'm at sort of at the bottom rung here. What can I say to these people in positions of power? Uh, so you do have to, you know, um, you know, understand that you actually have way more of a voice. Calling out is really important, um, but what's also really effective is calling in. You know, like uh, like telling people when when they have. Um, you, you'll find people that are very different stages basically here. Uh, intention is a really, really important part of it. I think, you know, again, people who are in these positions of power tend to think things are already fair. Uh, and then, you know, will slowly kind of understand that they're not. And, you know, that goes down a, a deeper and deeper, um, you know, understanding and you have to be ready to meet people where they're at. You also have to be ready to call people out when they need to be called out. And, and I think that that's, that's an important part of it. So students, I would say, um, you know, come be prepared to meet people where they're at uh, with it, but also um, be ready to challenge them on it. Your voice is very strong, much stronger than I think you realize. And one thing I'll add too, is that there's often opportunities uh, within these institutions um, to take on uh, governance positions for students. Um, and that's, a you might not think that that's a huge opportunity, but it is a very, very huge opportunity to drive change, to drive meaningful change at those highest levels. Um, and so if you do have uh, situations in which there might be, for example, EDI committees in, in your uh, department or in funding programs, uh, apply for them, you know, apply for those governance positions. They should generally be open, um, open calls for governance positions, not always. Uh, sometimes there's some uh, things around that. But if you do have those opportunities, uh, they're great learning experiences and they're really, really uh, impactful ways that you can make those changes. Jocelyn, would you like to add to that? Uh, sure. Uh, and building on this idea of, of what we've all been talking about, becoming uh, more informed. And uh, this applies to beyond uh, students to career advice and you know, understand the policies and procedures of your institution. Um, you know, and, and I'll say this, if you find yourself in a, 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 a job interview or, um, or, or in a job, you know, look at the policies, um, you know, the policies, people think, oh, the policies are what I can't do. And that's not true. The policies are um, what's expected, what you can do, what you shouldn't do, you know, the behaviors and things. And, and a procedure is, is actionable. How do, you know, it's the, the policy is the what, the procedure is, is the how. Um, and it's a really important thing with respect to EDI uh, to know what those policies and procedures say. Um, you know, even even the poorly written ones, it's important um, to to <laughs> to understand. And you know, you I have found myself um, at the other side of a of of um, the table, um, you know, uh, of of bad policies. And um, and a bad policy doesn't mean you don't have to follow it. Um, so it is important to know these things. And from those policies, you can be better informed, and you can look for. Um, the issues and then arm yourself with better information and then you can uh, and again this is more of that sort of grassroots bottom-up approach uh, but I always always say what does the you know I will always ask uh, what does the policy say and let's let's go from there so it is important to be looking at these policies um, as as sort of foundational uh, knowledge building. Jessica did you have something to add I see your hand up. I did, thanks. Um, so I just wanted to add a, a bit of advice because um, I have been in minority my whole life um, and I've been thrown under the bus a lot. I've had repercussions for speaking out um, at certain times. So there is a time and a place to speak out. Um, so I just wanted to provide some advice of steps I've taken to get to a place where I can influence change um, because I don't always sit in the seat of authority where I can mandate change. Um, but I believe everybody can lead from whatever position they're at. And so one of the biggest tools that have helped me is actually media training, public speaking. So knowing how to articulate what change you want, um, either in the five minutes you have to meet with a leader before going into a meeting or um, learning how to write a really good, well-written briefing note, which is a one or two page document summarizing the issue and the background and what do you want to happen in that meeting um, to hand to the right leader um, at the right time. 
um, but also finding the avenues to influence. And so what everyone had said really resonates. So get involved in your um, student societies. When surveys come, answer the surveys. Um, if you can't go to your leader, find allies and sponsors in other researchers or other people within the faculty, um, people who are in the rooms that you're not always invited into um, and make sure that they understand. Um, but also just really, um, really knowing um, and understanding that you are in a governance system that is prescribed, that change is not gonna happen overnight. So learning how to navigate that system. Um, all the faculties have councils, all of, there's task force for everything, there's committees for everything. So just knowing who is who um, in the zoo often helps. And again, using that influence um, and again, having your message clear, um, but also not just coming with complaints. Um, uh, with such large institutions where there's thousands and thousands of students, uh, a single person's complaint will sometimes be lost. So coming with not only the issue, but also some recommended paths forward. What, what is the next step? What's the next step? And, and keeping moving that along. So um, those are some of the things that have helped me over the years to, to um, really help to, to make some change. Thanks, Jessica. I think you all have really valuable insight into the kind of things that students can do to help get involved in these EDI action at institutions. Um, just in the interest of time, we did have some uh, audience questions that I wanted to make sure we had time for, so we'll jump to those now. Um, so the first question we have is, the success of EDI initiatives includes a si significant aspects that include cha the change in mindset that is required for the success of EDI. Do the panelists have any ideas on what strategies they have seen succeed towards in the change in mindset aspect of an EDI initiative? Anjay? Yeah, I think um, right off the bat, I think a really, really essential part is to, uh, and I think uh, this is something that Jessica was, was saying around why is this important. Research excellence has been very narrowly defined uh, for a long time. Uh, and so I think there's a lot to be said for expanding uh, that definition of, of what research excellence is um, for things that maybe have a community focus. I think there's a huge divide as well within the sciences between research and clinical work. Um, and so, you know, that that also has a major factor around it. So, um, yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll let others, uh, I know we don't have a lot of time here, so I don't want to get too much space. Nancy, go ahead. Just briefly, um, I had a really positive experience uh, dealing with the medical faculty in, at the University of Manitoba, which you wouldn't think that uh, a person concerned around disability issues would be uh, promoting the medical faculty, but this is where allies become important because the dean of a particular part of the medical faculty is very keen on disability as a social justice issue. So quite timidly, I began working with him at his request and we're starting ableism, ableism uh, roundtables all around the university. So I think that's really positive, going to non-traditional areas and finding allyships there. Jessica, do you have something to add? Yeah, and, and I'll keep it short, but I find it's effective when you share your personal stories and experiences. I know that puts you in a vulnerable state. Um, but I know for a lot of the truth and reconciliation work I do when I talk about the times when uh, I've been asked to leave hospitals because of my race or things that happened to me just because of um, my, my visible appearance, then that resonates. Or when I talk about um, the things that happened to my kids, or, then it resonates. So making it personal and bringing it to that vulnerable stage helps to bring, um, helps to bring the human to human connection rather than this dismissal that, okay, EDI is something I check mark off. Like it, it needs to be really tied into that. It is important on a people level. Thanks. So I think we're gonna move on to our next question, but it kind of stems from something that um, Anjay was talking about in their response to the first question. Um, and it's as follows. Um, one of the panelists mentioned redefining research excellence to move away from just traditional metrics and consider performance evaluation with an EDI lens. Are there equity informed performance evaluation models out there in academia that any of the panelists know about? Any organizations you're aware of that have implemented a model or are actively working on one that we can learn from? 
Anjay? Um, so one thing I think um, the CIHR did that was really quite impactful was uh, to introduce um, sex and gender based analysis plus uh, as a component of funding uh, mechanisms because for a long time in, in medical and health science research, um, there was a view that uh, women's bodies were too complicated to do research on. And so that oftentimes uh, you'd have all male participants, uh, you know, and including for, uh, you know, things that you wouldn't expect, you know, things that are clearly, uh, you know, uh, impact, impact women more than men, let's say. Um, so I think, you know, that that's one organization that I think has really done a good job in, in uh, requiring you know, a sex and gender based analysis component uh, within within their funding programs uh, to address that particular concern. So, yeah. And if I could just quickly build on that, um, because the work on EDI has been across the three agencies um, in, in ways that really are pushing us to coordinate more than we have before, there was always awareness of what another agency was doing, but now the call for coordination and where appropriate are harmonization. So, in natural sciences and engineering, um, you know, sex, gender, maybe, but um, not always. Nevertheless, um, very much in the footstep of what CIHR has sort of put down as an expectation and requirement in the context of criteria for your applications. We're now speaking of EDI considerations through the stages of research, and that guidance document was just put online this summer. Um, applicants will sort of justify whether it, is, whether it makes sense in theoretical physics, probably not, but in many aspects of engineering where there are gonna be human end users uh, in the development of technology, then absolutely you should consider matters of gender and or other diversity factors. So we're just there at a point where we're asking the scientists, all of them to make a conscious sort of reflection on who is this research about and who will be using this research. So from the very moment of setting the research question all the way to thinking through the data collection analysis, et cetera, but also towards the dis dissemination of findings, um, asking them to consider those diversity factors. Uh, so we think that very much the merit review that has a call for EDI consideration may not be applicable in all contexts, all disciplines, all types of research, but nevertheless, that has become uh, an expectation in natural sciences engineering. So it, uh, it is evolving. Uh, the conversations across the agencies are sort of uh, accelerating some of those changes um, beyond what we would have anticipated otherwise. Thanks. Does anyone have any other thoughts about how we can redefine research excellence to be more inclusive? No? Okay, so we can move on to the next question. I mean, it's something we talked about before, but I think we can dive into it in a bit more detail. In developing and implementing EDI action plans, academic and research institutions are establishing EDI committees, councils, and task force to lead this work. Most that this person's aware of don't compensate measures, and they're wondering, given the efforts that are required, whether there is a move towards looking at compensation models for this type of work. Um, Jessica, do you want to start us off? Sure, for sure. So, so definitely, I agree. For for many of the task force and committees, uh, it is um, in addition to uh, faculty work. But there are many institutions um, starting to make that more administrative positions, and I'm a good example of that. So, I, I'm not a full tenured professor. I'm an industrial professor, so I, I guess lecture and support in that way. But my primary purpose is administration. Um, and so part of that is running our portfolios that contribute to EDI and TRC work. Um, and so it's a good example that uh, there are institutions where this is part of the role of the person um, without the additional teaching and research load that would come with a faculty member. So there is movement towards it, it being part of a role for those who still do it on the part of, uh, uh, on the part of their desk in addition to um, teaching and research roles. It is harder for sure, definitely. Um, and I do know things are stretched thin, and that's where um, often we utilize the model where we do use students as well. Undergraduate students, we have a dedicated, for example, DIVI group, um, which is diversity and engineering group. Um, and often they help us with our um, survey data analysis and uh, disseminated information and helping with student consultation and things like that. So finding um, 
uh, many because again, EDI is something that affects everyone. So um, th there are different ways to um, make sure that the, the load is spread and not just um, sitting in a sole person perhaps. Does anyone have anything else to add? Okay. Oh, go I, ahead, I could say just a very quick word and not in direct response to the question, but um, fairness of the um, use of others' time is definitely a discussion that is going on again across the agencies. So in the context of um, the pandemic peer review that was done virtually, et cetera, et cetera, nevertheless, there was recognition that uh, for some that represented uh, additional expenses and uh, recognizing that we should perhaps so there is slowly, um, because indeed we do rely on a whole lot of hours uh, from the whole community that support our activities, uh, but recognition uh, of, of trying to make that work fair, um, not in a way that is going to be uh, taking away from, especially not taking away financially, if there are costs uh, related to peer review that we, we make whole the person who participates in peer review. So those discussions are extending, and I could see that Indeed, uh, Jessica was right that many of the positions are becoming sort of built in, but for those who otherwise continue to do the volunteer EDI work, uh, I think there's growing recognition that it is at the expense of other activities and ought to be at least duly recognized, and if not, perhaps even compensated. So active discussion and, and, and again, um, keep advocating for it um, to see that change come about. Thanks so much. So just in the interest of time, I think we're going to move on to our wrap up section now. Um, and for this question, I have a kind of rapid fire question for each of the panelists. And the purpose of this question is just to give kind of a quick summary insight into the future EDI practitioners of tomorrow, some of whom might be in attendance today about how they can best prepare and equip themselves to be successful in their EDI initiatives and activism. Um, so speaking from your personal experience in working in the EDI space, I'd like each of you to tell me in one sentence each, what was your biggest asset, resource or support system that, you had, that helped you? And what was the biggest hurdle that you encountered um, that might have made your work more difficult? Okay, so quick answers from everyone. Um, does anyone want to start, Kareen? I don't mind doing so from, again, the perspective of the Dimensions program. Um, what we think is going to be the biggest asset of it is compared to the programs that have been established in other countries, we've tried to really move away from the competitive model of it. So very symbolically, um, the UK program known as Athena Swan sets up a bronze and silver and gold uh, standard. And um, the cohort, the 17 institutions I referred to before that are helping co-develop the program have sort of really rejected that model and said, let's be fair that we're talking about a process of evolution. Let's start with the first level that we'll recognize is that you've initiated your work, that now it's been established, that you're advancing it, that you've reached a transformative level. Um, so moving away from the competitiveness, I think, is a very key asset. And another way we're doing that is that the resources we're slowly developing, but mainly a handbook for institutions to use, will be an accessible resource for the whole community. So hopefully that means a common sort of starting point where you know, if we all kind of agree, this is a starting point, we can all elevate beyond. So to me, that's going to be a real asset of moving away from the competitive, the, you know, only if you are led into the group, can you access the resources of the, the Dimensions program. So we, we, we hope to make that very much available. Hurdle for the Dimensions program has been the fact that across the different institutions, there wasn't all, um, there wasn't the same level of uh, data collection. And so Ignorance was a real good pretext to pretend none of this was really happening in our institutions. We, we believe there's generally fair representation or this or that. Getting the numbers, getting the truth of the, of the, um, of the, of, of, of the reality of what is uh, the makeup of a community, um, where they are and where they are not represented, where do they drop off at the level. So data remains a bit of a hurdle, but I think again that we're going to help uh, level up the playing field and that resource of the Dimensions Handbook and some other activities really good. Thanks, Karine. Let's move on to Jessica. For sure, this is a great question and I'm going to take a, a different kind of perspective, just personally, what has been my biggest assets and hurdles. So the biggest asset, of course, is, is my own self-motivation to make change in this area for equity, diversity, inclusion, and truth and reconciliation. 
um, not uh, necessarily always for myself, but for others that come behind me, especially my kids and, and future grandchildren someday. Um, and so one of the biggest assets, of course, are mentors and allies and sponsors who speak up um, on behalf of me and uh, my demographics um, within the rooms that I'm not privy to. Um, when it comes to hurdles, one of the biggest hurdle is having to do my own healing um, for the racist and trauma that I have been through while still having to run the professional race um, often at a quicker pace than uh, my um, my more mainstream colleagues as well. So that's the biggest hurdle. Perhaps Jocelyn, you'd like to go next? Sure. Um, biggest asset. Um, one good mentor, I'll call it one good mentor, it could be the title of a book or a movie, but, you know, and I've been fortunate that I've had a few, but, you know, finding that one person who, you know, not only has the time and the will to support you, but they'll do it no matter what, and they only have your best interest at heart, uh, I think is really important. Um, and I've been lucky to have that, um, you know, for both my professional and personal career, you just, you know, it's not about quantity, it's quality. No, just you just need one. Um, but you, you've got to find that one. <laughs> and biggest hurdle for me, um, just you know, being terrified to make a mistake and not um, including someone because I wasn't sure you know, how to pronounce their name, um, or I, I, um, you know, I wasn't sure what their pronoun is. Um, you know, it's just it's better to try and fail than to not try at all. And, you know, failure is not the opposite of success. It's part of it. And that's, you know, that struggle, that failure, that's where real deep learning happens. So, you know, don't, don't be afraid to make mistakes. They're important. Thank you. Perhaps Anjay next. Yeah, I think, um, I think to build on Jocelyn's point there, um, makes me think of Samuel Beckett's sort of most famous quote, which is the ever tried, ever failed, no matter, try again, fail again, fail better. Um, that's a, a good mantra in general, uh, I think. But um, to answer the question specifically, I think, you know, in terms of the biggest asset, I think uh, oftentimes leadership can be uh, one of the biggest assets if you have um, genuine uh, a leadership that actually genuinely cares uh, about these things. Uh, so that can, really can, uh, you know, driving things top down can really make a big difference. It can also be the biggest hurdle. Um, you can have a lot of, let's say symbolic, uh, you know, wanting to have conversations, but, you know, sort of not wanting to pick up or, or keep the ball rolling or anything uh, in any way. So I would say the biggest hurdle in particular, I would say is getting, um, you know, white cisgendered able-bodied men to do that labor as well uh, and not just rely on uh, persons affected. <laughs> by uh, inequities to, to do the labor. So, um, and, you know, that that's a whole process of getting them to, um, getting them on board, uh, I would say. Nancy? Um, a well-informed ally and a group of allies is priceless. On either side of the desk, wh whatever kind of um, allyship you need uh, and recognizing that those of us who are marginalized don't have the luxury of working in silos. We all have to work together. And it's really important because it underscores how many more commonalities there are than differences within these groups. And I think that uh, just expecting diversity from the outset and not just, just putting diversity as a central part of your entire process, that's a real benefit. And we're gradually getting there. The biggest uh, barrier that I encounter is uh, systemic, systemic discrimination that's so embedded that it's not even recognized. And that's for whatever marginalized group. I think we have to regularize the diversity lens and move EDI to the center of the discussion rather than a catchphrase. And I think we're gonna get there eventually. I hope we get there too as well. Um, so. We went a little over time, so I'd like to thank the panelists for staying an extra 10 minutes. I think we had some very productive and meaningful um, conversations. Your experiences and thoughts, I think, have been very useful for the attendees today and given us a lot to think about as we move forward in our own personal EDI journeys to try to help make some concrete action and concrete change at our own institutions. 
So again, I'd like to thank our panelists so much for being here today. Um, for those of you, we have another panel after this with some student EDI um, activists that will be, it was scheduled for 3.30. I think we're gonna push the start to 3.35 to give everyone a chance to get up, stretch, have a break and get a snack. Um, so I'll see you all at 3.35. Thanks so Thank much. You. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Emma Anderson, and I'm joining you from Jojage, or Montreal, the traditional unceded territory of the Ganyo Gehage Nation. I will be the moderator of the panel. I'm a master's student in bioresource engineering at McGill University, and I'm also a volunteer at Science Policy Exchange. So, as we've seen during the practitioner panel, as well as the Dimensions keynote address and workshop, students can play a really important role in pushing our institutions to enact actual change within their structures. At the same time, students have a unique perspective to what EDI gaps there are within the institutions, but may face barriers that practitioners don't face. So today we have a panel of five students with a range of experiences in EDI initiatives within their respective institutions, as well as outside their institutions. And I really hope that this is gonna be valuable for our attendees, especially those attendees that are students and are looking to get involved in EDI initiatives in their own universities and beyond. So we're gonna start off the panel by doing a brief introduction. So I want to ask the panelists to take a few moments to introduce themselves, as well as their experience in EDI initiatives and what they're currently working on. And just a quick reminder to all the participants, if you have questions for the panelists, you can put them in the Q&A and we will address them at the end of the panel. So let's start off with Karen, Carolyn Tinglin. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Carolyn. Uh, I just wanted to uh, acknowledge and say thank you uh, to the uh, nations in which I um, live, work, and play. So that would be Kwantlen, Semiyamu, and Katsi nations. Um, also want to uh, give thanks to uh, my ancestors for paving the way for me to be here as well. So um, yeah, I'm a PhD student at Simon Fraser. I'm in the curriculum studies program with a focus on education equity. And uh, yeah, I'm in my second year about to um, uh, prepare for my proposal defense. I, I also sit on SFU's uh, EDI council and the, the council is kind of how, how uh, we've kind of approached EDI. Um, and this is my second term on that council. So uh, my research really focuses fo on um, uh, youth uh, who are uh, racialized, Black and Indigenous youth specifically, who uh, have intellectual and developmental disabilities and kind of taking a look at the education systems uh, that they're in and how their social identities are impacted by these disability labels that they carry around with them. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Let's move on to Karen Tang. Hi, everyone. My name is Karen Tang. My pronouns are she, her, and I am currently a third year PhD student in clinical psychology at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. So Dalhousie University is located in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. So my research primarily looks at addictive disorders, so like video gaming, gambling, as well as, as well as its association with mental health, so depression, anxiety, as well as the interplay of sociocultural factors, such as stigma and culture. I also do work on a variety of research passion projects that include research around EDI and increasing diversity in STEM. 
So science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medicine. I am primarily involved in EDI as a vocal advocate, providing both a student perspective as well as an individual from both the BIPOC and disabled communities. I do sit on two EDI committees. However, what I discussed today will primarily focus on my experience in the area of advocacy. So current ongoing projects I'm involved in include removing the GRE or the graduate record exam, which is a common admissions requirement used in North America for various graduate programs, including in counseling and clinical psychology. Research has shown that the GRE does systematically exclude applicants from underrepresented groups, and it's really not predictive of success in any programs. So I'm really trying to spearhead the development of a widely shared living document for clinical and counseling psychology programs across North America that have removed the GRE requirement. Um, I am also, I also tweet a lot <laughs> on my Twitter about EDI in higher education, be it raising concerns about the lack of diverse representation in academia or better ways you can integrate EDI practices into our research and teaching. You can find me on Twitter at Karen Tang underscore. Thank you um, for the inv invite. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you so much. Let's go on to Taylor Morso. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I am Taylor and I am Cree in English. Uh, I'm a proud member of Pegwis First Nation as well. And my pronouns are she and her. Uh, I am today presenting from my traditional homelands on Treaty 1 territory, uh, what is now known in the province of Manitoba. Treaty 1 is the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Inaneo, Anishinaneo, Dakota, and Denny peoples, and of course the homeland of the Métis Nation. And so I decided to pursue my post-secondary education on my home territory for many reasons, uh, but now I'm a fifth year PhD candidate at the University of Manitoba, and I study in the Department of Pharmacology and Therapeutics. Uh, my research itself examines kind of early onset type 2 diabetes among Indigenous youth in Manitoba, but I have a really wide scope that encompasses uh, things like genetics, traditional foods, colonization, and of course, uh, therapeutics, for example. My experience in EDI initiatives kind of weave in and outside of academia um, by nature of the work that I do with Indigenous community and also the emphasis that I personally have on things like Indigenous data sovereignty. So meaning Indigenous people have a right to our data, our knowledge, and our biological and genetic resources. And we often have the need to protect those resources from extraction by colonial institutions like universities. Um, but a few concrete examples of that include uh, recently I've served on, I continue to serve on the Native Biodata Consortium, which is the first Indigenous led biobank uh, in the United States. And I also do a lot of consulting and advising for various Indigenous led organizations, um, both in a research and teaching capacity to broaden my kind of expertise and bridge the gap that I see between science and policy though. I also serve uh, in an advisory capacity to the Chief Science Advisor of Canada, Dr. Uh, Mona Niemer, as one of 20 uh, youth advisors on her inaugural uh, youth council. And then lastly, I also am one of the few trainees to serve currently on an institute advisory board for CIHR. Um, so I serve on CIHR's ITSI. But I hope that is changing uh, in the near future because student voices are integral to this landscape as well. But I'm really excited to sit on this panel today and surrounded by such incredible company. So Eko, say for having me. Thanks. Thank you so much. Let's move on to Karen, Co Karen Cohen Sanchez. Hi, it's Karen. Thank you. Uh, I'm from uh, the University of Ottawa. I'm a PhD candidate in my third year. I like to recognize that we are currently on the Turtle Island of um, the Algonquin Territory. What I'm currently working on at the University of Ottawa are a series of anti-racism workshops for undergrad students and also high school students. So it would be grade 11 and grade 12. I'm also developed an inclusivity statement that I'm fighting to have included in the syllabus for undergrad and graduate students at the University of Ottawa. I'm also part of the CSA, which is the Canadian Sociology Association uh, Black Cactus. And I'm also involved in the new anti-Black advisory group for sharks. 
So these are things that I'm working on. My experiences involves in anti-Black racism on campuses, the rationalization of power dynamics and how it impacts students' accomplishments within Canadian institutions, the polite and covert forms of racism, the way it is embedded and in, in, ingrained in our structures and how that has an impact on our progress academically. And um, that's it. Also, I tweet, so. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, let's move on to Hannah Wakelin. Hello, everyone. Um, so firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that where I live, love and work and where my university McGill is, uh, is situated on some unceded Kenyan Kaka ter traditional territory. Um, so through this acknowledgement, I hope to respect the diverse indigenous peoples connected to this territory on which I work and live in today. Um, my name is Hannah Wakeling. I use she, her, L pronouns. Um, I'm a fifth year PhD student uh, in high energy uh, particle physics. So um, as such, the EDI work I've done has been purely non-research based. Um, I've been an active participant and volunteer in many different EDI groups at McGill um, and other places, including their Women in Physics group um, and the McGill Physics EDI committee. Um, so in these roles, I was often a student liaison who worked on tangible actions to encourage an inclusive environment in the department, um, for example, through creating events and inclusive spaces um, and in the EDI li library, for example. <clears throat> Um, I've also helped uh, work on implementing things like a departmental value statement, which, although um, reflected the overall McGill value statement, uh, was an unexpectedly long process uh, with many revisions and some pushback. Uh, but finally, it was voted to be implemented and is now available on our McGill physics website. So, yay. <laughs> uh, I've also been privileged enough to have had paid coordinatorships that allowed me to, um, me and other people, to take educational EDI workshops out to CJEPs and high schools. Um, and I've also worked in my collaboration, Bell 2's uh, Diversity and Inclusion Committee, presenting our first ever public talk on um, our diversity inclusion efforts um, at ICHEP 2020. And I'm currently writing the first internal report um, on our full findings, whilst also trying to finish my thesis sometime this decade. <laughs> awesome. So as you guys can see, um, we have a wide range of different students with lots of different experiences. So we're gonna move on to some questions. I will direct the question at one person, but you're welcome to jump in, or you can also use the raised hand feature, either is fine. So to start off, the first question is, how does the university benefit from having EDI initiatives? And what are some weaknesses of institutionalized EDI initiatives? And I'd like to start with Hannah. Sure. So um, a university having EDI initiatives shows that there are not just people within the system that care and want equitable, diverse, and inclusive environment, um, but like a structure within the system that can not only protect people, but help them thrive, um, hopefully. Uh, naturally, bureaucracy has its own pitfalls, um, but having this structure makes discrimination, et cetera, harder to get away with. Um, and hopefully the members of the community would feel that. Um, some of the weaknesses for me is linked to the strength I just mentioned. Um, the bureaucracy grants some protection and anonymity in a reporting process, um, but people in their experience often get lost in paperwork. Um, so sure, a person, for example, may get a new supervisor because of a settled harassment case, um, but are they going to be okay after that experience? Are they going to thrive in this environment in which they've suffered? I'm not so sure. Carolyn, do you have any thoughts on that? Sure, I think uh, depending on which lens uh, you're kind of looking at in terms of, or looking from or through, um, when it comes to the benefits uh, you know, of EDI in a university setting, from the university standpoint, you know, it's a really great opportunity to um, get leadership involved, uh, uh, not just on a very superficial level, uh, in terms of equity and uh, I like equity and justice, the whole diversity thing is a little uh, 
controversial for me, but um, in terms of, uh, you know, really promoting and uh, kind of putting your money where your mouth is, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an awesome opportunity for leadership to get involved and to really be connected um, with the student body, with faculty and, uh, and with staff. Um, you know, it's a, it's a way to uh, demonstrate that they're serious about, leadership is serious about um, equity and justice. And then also, you know, all universities have bias and, uh, and even racial blind spots. And I think the EDI is also a great opportunity to, to be able to focus on those things and to be able to pick up on these, uh, these blind spots and take action. Um, and then also, uh, you know, it's, it's good business sense. If you are excluding um, and, and pushing out uh, people who are historically marginalized and, and, uh, and racialized in the, in the university community, you're missing out on a lot of talents, knowledge, expertise. And so it just makes good business sense from that standpoint. From a student standpoint, you do feel, as um, Hannah alluded to, uh, that you that there is some place where you can go if you've got um, issues around equity and justice. That you know there there is at least somebody symbolically or or a um, a part of the organization symbolically that uh, that you can go to for resources that you can go to uh, uh, to to get connected and networked in. Uh, and that can be very beneficial, uh, of course. And yeah, if, if you can, if universities can uh, ensure that you know the EDI council or group is not you know a tokenized exercise or, or a, you know, just a check mark on a list, uh, and it's actually instrumental in moving and changing. Uh, and again, with the the support and help of leadership, then I mean, it's a huge benefit to the whole community. Okay, for the sake of time, let's move on to the next question. So right now we have, we're talking about EDI initiatives that are within the institutions, such as EDI action committees, but what are some of the strengths and weaknesses of working on EDI outside of academic institutions? So I'd like to direct this question first to Karen, since um, I know that you're very vocal on Twitter <laughs> and using that as your platform for advocacy. Um, so yeah, what are some of the strengths and weaknesses of working on EDI outside of academic institutions? Yeah, absolutely. I like love that question. Um, so how I use Twitter, I use it to really do a lot of advocacy. So I find that a strength of working on EDI outside of ac academic institutions is that you can really build your work to nourish you. So I really, um, consider my EDI advocacy or work as one of my passion projects. And as a result, I can really make it work best for me and my own personal values and goals and like what I want to achieve. And so I can pursue both the work that I'm interested in, uh, which may not entirely align with my academics institutional goals or what their EDI community is looking for. So it really, I really try to make it work for me. Um, so for example, uh, what started as a collaboration on Twitter, um, with similar like-minded advocates actually turned an essay on responses to 10 common criticisms of anti-racism action in STEM, into media interviews, and even into a peer-reviewed paper in the Journal of PLOS Computational Biology. So really, there you can really make it work for you. And so on the flip side, in terms of weaknesses, um, at times it can really seem like academic institutions don't really hear your voice or what you have to say. Um, but I'm here to tell you that it's important to really remind yourself that your voice does matter as do all your EDI work. So academia, academic, academia tends to be very slow at processing change, um, but don't, please don't let that stop you or your passion. Thank you. On the flip side, Taylor, I know that you're involved not in your academic institution, but as uh, on the Chief Science Advisor Youth Council. So can you share the strengths and weaknesses of working in that kind of capacity in um, these kind of comprehensive organizations? Sure, uh, yeah, and I work on a lot of different things, including this Chief Science Advisor Youth Council. And 
Maybe I'll touch on it a little bit first though, as I mentioned kind of in my intro, as I kind of weave in and out of academic institutions, um, that includes the chief science advisor, that includes working for what is um, a really passion project of mine is like indigenous led organizations that work on health equity. So for me, I'm not really, and the reason maybe why I don't work so much in the academy is because I'm really not concerned whether those institutions are successful or not because of their own metrics that don't really fit me anyways. And so I know there are really wonderful people, including some here that are working towards institutional change, that are working towards anti-racism policies and are, are making the change that needs to happen. Uh, for myself, it's just these institutions were not made for Indigenous people, and we know that. And for myself to try and come in, I just see the power dynamics, and I see that the, you know we already have documents like the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action that clearly lay out the change that needs to happen. So for me, I think it's more of like the people in power need to make those changes and need to make that action happen. Um, otherwise, I'm just reading the script that the TRC that already exists. So in my capacity, I'm really more committed to uh, the success of Indigenous people. And for me, that comes down to recognizing our knowledge systems. And for that, I see the value in doing research and EDI initiatives and advocacy outside of academic spaces. So for uh, example, in Manitoba, we have really phenomenal Indigenous-led organizations that are advancing Indigenous health equity um, and inclusion and, and everything that we're talking about today in ways that academic institutions are just incapable of doing by virtue of, of who they are. And so I think the strength in that lies in Indigenous leadership and ownership of our initiatives um, that impact the people who uh, are you know, part of them. So in the fields that I work in, which is genetics, we know there's this increasing push for diversity in the sense that like 99 or something percent of all people enrolled in GWAS studies are of European ancestry. And so the push to recruit diverse or racialized or indigenous people into these studies to increase quote unquote representation is not achieving equity. In fact, we are really just exploiting indigenous people who have an inherent right to own and access their biological and digital sequence information. So I think this is the strength of when I say about like working outside or working in indigenous organizations or even on the CSA, like working outside of places that allow you to take action in ways that EDI is already just embedded into the framework and it's not an afterthought. Um, so that's really important to me, but obviously the weakness is recognition of knowledge systems at both an organizational level and an individual level. So if organizations that are indigenous led are often not recognized by the tri-agency or they're also fighting for the same funding pool as the large institutions. And so you can see where uh, you know, funding gaps are, are just are widened. Um, we also individually, our knowledge systems are typically not recognized as you know, real world expertise or um, you know, they're not valued to the same extent as university degrees or doctorates. And so when we talk about removing barriers in EDI, I think it's sometimes about we, as people who are trying to implement EDI, need to reevaluate our own understanding about what constitutes knowledge and expertise, rather than simply trying to recruit people into a colonial institution, a, a study, trying to just put them into the places and check the boxes, rather than, you know, actually making the changes. So I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. I think something that you mentioned earlier that's really salient is kind of the power dynamics that can exist when students try to get involved in EDI initiatives. And it was something that was brought up in the last uh, panel as a question to panelists. Um, some participants mentioned that they had received negative uh, impacts of coming forward with EDI complaints. So. Moving on to the next question, kind of in that theme, how can students initiate EDI projects within and outside their institutions? Um, and again, I'm going to uh, put this towards Karen, but I would like to remind the panelists, anyone's welcome to jump in or put a hand up if you have uh, something to contribute. I can start us off. So again, in terms of initiating EDI outside of your institution, um, my first piece of advice is really to find like-minded, passionate individuals who can really uplift you and provide a sense of community, um, because really you are going to have to really build that community. Um, there's no like 
you're not part of an EDI committee, presumably, so you really have to build your own community um, because a community is not provided to you. So I recommend drawing on resources such as the academic realm of Twitter, which I'm very active in, um, as well as networking to find those who perhaps have similar experiences you, who can really, who you can really align with um, and truly hear you and what you have to say. A fantastic community that does really amazing advocacy work um, in psychology is called, they're called Psych and Out. Um, and so I really cannot emphasize how important Twitter has been in my work as an EDI advocate. And my second piece of advice is really to find your voice. So oftentimes I feel like I should change like a plethora of things in academia from advocating for a greater emphasis on mental health in students to EDI advocacy. Uh, I can tell you right now that from personal experience that it can be very exhausting to always have to advocate for yourself, not only as a student from an underrepresented group, but also in the area of EDI. So you do have to be very kind to yourself and know your limits. So learn to strike a balance that really works for you. Um, so be it working in a committee or striking out on your own as an advocate. So really pick and choose your battles uh, because again, your time and energy is very limited. So be kind to yourself. Carolyn, would you like to jump in? Uh, yeah, I was just gonna say, um, thank you so much, Taylor, uh, for all that, that you had said and, and mentioned about uh, being in the institution and the institutional environment as a student in the institutional environment and education environment. Um, I can say that allyship is extremely important. So as a student, finding allies, allies who are faculty and staff members, um, allies who are fellow students who uh, wanna make waves, um, that uh, has been uh, something that was somewhat successful in our EDI council. So our original council, um, you know, there, there was some representation, um, uh, but we could do with more. Um, and uh, together we, um, we really pushed for having more students on the council and uh, more students who are traditionally and historically underrepresented on the council. And so I think the, the, the opportunity there uh, is, is huge, but allyship is extremely important. If it's possible to join you know, within the school environment, to join groups, we've got SOCA, we've got a, you know, the African Students um, Association as well. So if you can join groups uh, that are within the institution, within academia and your school, um, that can be a form of allyship as well, where as a group, uh, you've got a voice together. So that's really, that's really very important. Um, and I think that's a great pathway uh, to, to making waves and to, uh, and to kind of connecting with the EDI council if you have one at your school uh, and letting your presence be known. Yeah. Thank you so much. I definitely think that there's uh, power in numbers, and that's great advice for all the students watching right now. So moving on to the next question, it's how can institutions better support and work with students in realizing EDI initiatives? Now, Corinne, you um, were part of creating an anti-racism committee uh, in your department, and you also, in your own words, have been fighting to get the inclusivity statement that you developed adopted. So can you speak about how the institution, uh, in your case, University of Ottawa and other institutions can better support EDI initiatives? Um, what's your experience on that? Um, it wasn't easy. I think you need to be consistent because it's so easy. It's easier to just give up, especially when you're a visible minority because it's personal in the sense is that you are advocating your lived experiences in relation to these changes. So these, to, to, to initiate systematic changes. Um, I created a sense of a community with other BIPOC uh, students at the university and outside of the university. And numbers is force. So let, the fact that we created the sense of community and we went forward with proposal, we went forward with, we, we contacted people that were in position of power because having the community itself is one thing, but we need systematic change to take place. We can't do that on our own. Allyships are great, but I'm always going back and forth with that relationship. That's just my own personal situation because allyship 
there's a sense of accountability and reflection that needs to take place before entering a space, a space of anti-racism. But that's a separate component. But the support system, I did, I was met with resistance. It's not something that you just go and you propose something and they're like, yeah, sure, we'll embark in your project. There was resistance. And uh, when the resistance comes, you have to keep fighting through the grains because what I keep telling myself is that these people that are in a position of power are part of a system themselves. It's not to, it's not to like dismiss the fact that there's their behavior, they can't be accountable for their behavior, but it takes that extra push for them to understand what they're actually doing is covert racism without them understanding that they're doing covert racism. So there's a counseling process involved, unfortunately, and, and, it, and it's, a, it's a lot, it's an emotional labor and it's free because a lot of the work that we do is based on our personal time. Some of the some of the the mechanism in place is that I created a community with, with black students and BIPOC students. We did fashion shows. We made our presence known in a space that tried to invisible invi invi invisibilize us for years. By doing these cultural activities on campus, our present became more known. And then I went to deans, vice provosts, different faculties that had power to change. And then I also recruited professors that wanted to initiate the change, but that themselves were in the barriers where they couldn't initiate change. Just because you hire a rationalized prof professor, he or she cannot, doesn't necessarily have the power to initiate change. We have to keep that in mind. Having the students' voices out created that collaboration with BIPOC and rationalized professors to engage in the change. So it was a force that came forward and they were very happy in order to have that support. It's weird, but it was reversed. It was the students supporting the professors for them to have that 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 push to push forward. Because you in my department, for example, there's only one black professor for 15 years. Uh, that's full time that can supervise. We have a bunch of part time professors. You see, like there's definitely this 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 equilibrium in the process of fighting the power struggles and dynamics. Um, just a quick follow-up question. You mentioned that um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to dismantle um, racism and racist bias that people might not even be aware that they hold. Is that related to the high school workshops that you're holding? Um, and could you just speak about that for a moment? Yeah, thank you for that question. That's exactly it because when you're part of a system, you become the system without understanding that you are the system. What that means is you are enacting behaviors covertly, subconsciously, unconscious biases without even understanding that you're part of this mechanism because we're programmed that way. So the workshops was for me to break down these barriers and it was for, and I wanted to start even younger, but I started, and this was also a proposal that I introduced to their dean and I recruited the African School of Economics. So it's an international anti-racism workshop that's taking place. And these workshops are to introduce for everyone, for students themselves to be part of the conversation. This is, this is not a black issue. And I'm speaking because I'm a black woman, but this isn't a BIPOC issue. This isn't an indigenous issue, it's a system issue. And unless we all are involved, collaboratively and respectfully in spaces where we can have these kind of discussions, students are mimicking behaviors that are told. If the literature does not talk about black scholars, they don't know that there are scientists that are blacks. They don't know that there are engineers that are black. They don't know Canadian black scholars. They don't know indigenous black scholars. They don't know Asian black scholars, Canadians. They have this prototype and this understanding that Canadians look a certain way. So when you're introducing EDI to people who've been in the system that have become deans and that are in a position of power, that, that in itself is a reflection process for them to understand that, uh, wait a minute, there are other people that are qualified to be in these positions too. The question is, why aren't they there? Why don't they continue in the system? What barriers is it blocking? So the anti-racism workshops that, I'm, that, I'm in the, that I initiated is to have these conversations with students, for them to talk among each other in, an, in a space where African students, or exp expressing their lived experiences in, this, in the system and Canadian students can express their lived experiences. And there's this exchange because racism is not experienced the same. Racism in Canada is not the same that's in the US. 
the same that is shared in, in Africa, the shame that is air that is shared in Caribbean. That's also something that I'm trying to dismantle. Don't group everyone together and think that we all experience racism the exact same way. So having these open conversations opens a different way of thinking about racial disparities and it opens the, the student's mind to accepting differences. The problem is accepting the differences that has created this division among students that become professors, that become dean, that become vice deans. I think I went way over my time, so I'll stop talking now. No problem. I think that that's such a powerful message and such a great reason for students to get involved in EDI work while they're students, whether that's in high school, in undergrad, postgraduate, anything, because they are going to be the workforce one day. And so doing the work and getting involved now is going to help broaden their whole worldview so that we can actually move forward on uh, dismantling systemic biases and creating more equitable, diverse, and inclusive uh, university and society. Uh, Carolyn, you had your hand up. I'm wondering if you want to jump in there. Uh, just very quickly, um, Corinne, that was fire. Um, yeah, I, the whole the whole um, issue around um, disempowerment and people in power not being connected. That's one of the things that we um, have been working on the past couple of years. So, um, you know, having a per person who's in a position of power, whether they're, you know, the um, head administrator or they're the president or vice president of the school, there and present at our meetings. And that way we can directly speak to that person and they can directly hear what the concerns are, what the issues are, what we're doing well as a school, what we're not doing well as a school. And some of these conversations, they're, they're difficult, they're challenging for some of us, more challenging than others. Um, but those conversations have to happen, they have to take place. So getting, getting administrative personnel and people who are in positions of power to make those decisions, make those changes, that's very important. So I would suggest that's also a, a, a strategy that can be used as well, is get them to the table. Um, um, outreach has re been really important for us as well. So creating committees and subcommittees where we're partnering with student groups, where we're reaching out to student groups, we're having round tables, um, we're planning on you know, having people come, these student groups and students come to um, some of our meetings and, and present, that's th those relationship and that relationship building is really important. But as Corinne said, my goodness, having people in positions of power, there seated at the table, or we come to them um, and bring these issues up with them and, and work with them and hold them accountable um, for the decisions that they're making. And in many cases, universities have policies right? You, you can't really get around policy. So if your policy says X, Y, and Z, why aren't we doing X, Y, and Z? And ask the people up top, why aren't we doing X, Y, and Z? How can we make this happen? How can we make this change? And as Corinne said as well, like you, you just have to kind of keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. And you also have to share the burden, unfortunately, right? Having everybody burnt out um, is, is not a good thing. That's not going to serve, you know, any purpose. So um, sometimes, you know, we have to take turns, step back, step forward, you know, take up a cause, not take up a cause, and uh, and and share some of that responsibility. It is hard work. It's not easy work. It wouldn't be, you know, we wouldn't be here if it was easy. So, yeah. Corinne, do you want to uh, respond to that? I just have to uh, add that there is there's the component of safe space that is not necessarily admissible to visible minorities when they have these discussions. Because when you do EDI and you're part of the group, you're, they're, they're, the way the information is received from the public isn't the same. So that, there has to be this, this consciousness when people are involved in EDI, whether it be visible minority, whether it be a physical disability, whatever, wherever you fit in, when you're advocating for that group, the emotional labor is very, very strong and very, and, 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 and if you you take you never detach like I don't stop being black because I, I stop these committees I go home I'm still black I walk down the street I'm still black I go to the store I'm still black so I think people need to they, there's no disconnection like I can't stop being black so this isn't this isn't a this isn't this is this isn't a, just a committee this is a this is a, a life change reality for me my uncles my brothers my cousins 
and we got to keep going. So for me, consistency is the main part in, in any work that we do. Because I know a lot of people get involved in this in these different committees and they go home nine to five and they, they do and they just forget about everything else. But there needs to be this conscious that this does that's not reality for a lot of us who are involved in these in these committees. It's a personal mission. And this is what makes the fight um, emotional and this is what creates the labor. So I just wanna make, I wanna highlight that point. Thank you. I think that's a great point. And it kind of comes back to what Anjay was saying during the practitioner panel that there needs to be um, more work done by people who are cis, who are white, who are part of the um, groups that are not marginalized in society. And also it comes back to the question of proper compensation. Um, I just wanna remind all the participants that we're about to go into the Q&A section. So if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A and you can also rate questions uh, if you like the question that someone uh, said, so it will get a higher priority. I'm gonna move on to the rapid fire up. Uh, or rapid fire wrap up. So basically, I wanna quickly summarize what's in store for the future of EDI work in academia and research based on your own experiences. So each of you is gonna have a chance to answer and we'll just go one at a time. Speaking from your own experiences, what is one gap in current EDI, in the EDI work and one exciting uh, future direction? And let's start with Hannah. Sure. Um, so as I alluded to earlier, I'm really quite passionate about keeping um, EDI like initiatives about the people it represents. Um, sometimes it feels like EDI work is moving towards bureaucratic pr protective processes, which is great, um, with organizations just patting themselves on the back for doing a great job um, and forgetting uh, about like well forgetting about things and moving away from small events and spaces that would actually help the people um, feel included um, the the protective spaces um, processes are a good thing but uh, we can't let the people be forgotten um, in any university or department you can fix this by making sure to have events like uh, uh, continue to ha have or continue to have uh, international students nights, uh, have a, a First Nations house on campus, um, have online games nights, have events without alcohol, have events that respect religious events like the Sabbath um, and celebrate holidays other than Christmas. Um, those are some of the things that we've been working on. Um, one exciting future direction uh, is that so many of us are now working in EDI. Um, the awareness is much higher. Um, when I started in my undergrad, it felt like nothing compared to what it does now, and it's still growing. There is there is so much more to do still, um, and we're and it's really easy to be overwhelmed by that. Um, but I feel like we're heading in the right direction, slowly and most of the time. Thank you, Taylor. Sure. Yeah. Uh Basically, my answer is the same in that the emphasis on recruitment to increase diversity, uh, as well as inclusion, they really fall short. So don't perpetuate colonialism in the academy by simply recruiting and representing underrepresented folks. Uh, that's just academic colonialism. To me, I think equity is the most important aspect of EDI. We don't need Indigenous people to be involved in your niche little thing for them still to be deserving of equity. Uh, I think we just need to have that lens whenever we approach this work. Uh, so that's kind of the, the gap that I think is missing is we just have this hyper focus on diversity without the equity part. And then uh, the future direction though, I think for myself is that we're at this like very exciting turning point in my mind of what we can start to rethink what knowledge systems that we value. Um, so for me, I think about like the climate crisis and indigenous ecological knowledge and how these um, these global crises right now are really shining the light on where indigenous knowledge and other other types of knowledge that have not been valued in the academic academic world for so long can actually be really, really important for solving modern challenges. 
And so I think with the, with the lens of EDI, if we integrate and we use EDI as a framework in the base of all of our projects, that's when we can start to actually synergize those knowledge systems. And that's when we can start to solve those modern challenges, but it can't happen without equity. It can't happen without actual recognition of, of knowledge creation and, and like solid commitment to justice and equity. So, okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, so similar to both what Taylor said, um, it's really time to create an, a more equitable anti-racist environment for underrepresented groups. So institutions are often prioritizing recruitment over retention of students or faculty, for example, which ends up doing a lot more harm than good. And it's really irresponsible to, again, recruit faculty or students from underrepresented groups into really unsupportive culture or community. So it's really time to foster an inclusive workplace culture, um, and that needs to be constantly maintained to ensure retention of these individuals. Um, in terms of a future direction, Hannah basically took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> I'm very excited that there are a lot, there's a lot more interest in EDI and how we can implement EDI practices in academia, um, including in the recruitment and retention of students, as well as in our teachings. So we do have a, we still have a ways to go in terms of um, being able to fully incorporate all diverse needs and voices, um, but it gives me hope that we are finally talking about EDI in academia. And so it also really gives me hope that there are so many of you in the audience who have taken time out of this Saturday to listen to what we have to say. So thank you very much. And I encourage you, if this is an area of interest, to pursue it. Um, because I truly think you can make a difference. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Corinne? So the first question is, um, let me go back because I kind of got lost. I can, I can repeat yeah, tell the question. Me. Yeah. So speaking from your own experiences, mm -hmm. what is one gap in current yeah. EDI work and one exciting future direction? So I think the gap is the institutionalization of, of EDI. And, and the reason I'm saying that is because it creates a disassociation from the people in power to be responsible and the people that are, that are, that are, that are, that are victims of systematic racism. So when you, take someone and you tokenize them and, because, and you do a check mark and you, you fulfill your mandate. So these, are, they have, every dean I think on campuses have a mandate to address anti-racism now or EDI. So they've done their part and then they just leave as if it's going to unfold and things are going to change on its own. Anything that involves changing an ingrained system that is based on colonial structures has to be done consistently. It has to be something done or put in place that will be long-term for the students to have a place to go, have to seek. It's not because you did a panel discussion or you made a couple of comments online that you've addressed it. This, this is what I mean when I say institutionalization. It, and and I, this is one of the papers that I wrote. It became a check mark list and then you look good for, for saying something that sounds good, but the actions don't follow and there's nothing that's in place that's long-term. Bursaries, for students, 80% of bursaries who, students who receive bursaries are white students. My, my, the minority of the students don't receive bursaries. There's a problem in this. What, what are we doing to change the system for funding for students in order to continue their post-secondary education on campus? We have 200 students that start at first grade and then you have, I'm the only black student that's doing, that's not, that's not because I'm smarter. There's a gap. There's a gap of retaining rationalized students to continue their studies. And addressing it and making it not institutionalized is the first part. How can we implement long-term um, goals and, and, and action plans that actually address systematic barriers and have it in place? What I'm hoping for the future is that I don't need to be having this conversation anymore. <laughs> I don't wanna be talking about this anymore. So I'm hoping that this is going to be resolved. I'm happy that we're having the conversation but I don't want conversation to go in deaf ears. I don't want to be talking and wasting my energy and my precious breath on something that has been said since Malcolm X was alive. Like I want to see changes and action being done. So 
and yeah, they're like, oh, you come off at, like, you know, you're, whenever we have these discussions, you're angry, you're, you know, angry black woman. And so what? So what if I'm angry? Yes, I'm angry because I have to battle these, these, these things all the time. And yeah, it make, I'm not going to come in and have these conversations with a happy smiley face to make your level of comfort feel more comfortable. So there also, there has to be this level of discomfort and you have, and the people receiving it has, we have to be okay with that. Because I'm not preoccupied with how you're feeling when I'm expressing my lived experiences. So if we can disassociate that part and we can have real honest ongoing conversations, whether it hurts your feelings or not, we can start putting in action plans for long term for rationalized students to actually continue and not feel like they're going into a space where they're afraid to talk in the classroom or they feel they feel targeted if, if it's Black History Month and there's like two Black students and all of a sudden I'm this hyper, I'm, I'm visible and I need to sit there and feel like I need to have this, this weight on my back and defend my, my race. Like there's so many different elements in, in, in addressing that. There's so many gaps, but also I'm seeing that the gap is reducing itself because we're talking about it, but I would like to see actions being, so for actions to take place is the people in position of power have to put in forward and not institutionalize EDI or anti-racism work. So I went, out, went off, but I get passionate and that's who I am. So I'm real with it. <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing that passion with us. Um, I think one thing that you said that kind of comes back to the Dimensions workshop that we had earlier was when action plans are created, um, but they can be created really bad. Like the goals can be very vague. The um, actual uh, activities might not actually address the issue that's at hand. And in the end, when they are evaluating whether or not this action plan was successful, they need to make sure that they're evaluating the uh, how the impact of that initiative impacted the target of the initiative, not just the reputation of the university um, and so forth. So thank you so much for that. Carolyn, last but not least. Last but not least. <laughs> yeah, I mean, y'all touched on it. And of course, Karine, you touched on it. Karine, you touched on it. Um, a big gap is really the integration of anti-racist, anti-colonial equity and justice based um, initiatives and policies, right? So there's a huge gap between what's written on paper and what is being actioned. And so, um, you know, it, it needs to be integrated throughout uh, institutions and institutional systems. It's, it's not a one-off. Technically, it really even shouldn't really be like a separate section or group or whatever the case may be. It's, it's supposed to be part of uh, the academic environment. So I think that's a big gap, gap is, the, is the integration of EDI efforts or equity and uh, justice uh, based uh, initiatives and efforts and policies and, um, you know, bringing them to, to life and actually having them be lived in the uh, academic institution. So, um, but in terms of, and, and part of that is um, what was mentioned earlier, right? So identity-based um, scholarships, um, faculty r and &R. So these are, you know, these are very, to me, very straightforward ways that that um, policies and um, that are based on equity and based in equity and justice can actually be actioned. Um, what the barriers are, and again, hold people to, you know, hold their feet to the fire when that's not taking place. And, and uh, you know, I could go on about that, but I won't. Future directions, well, this is kind of part of what I was saying in terms of integration, right? So if the institution, if, if, if academic institutions are part of the community, then we should be, creating community collectives that hold universities accountable. So um, these community collectives, if you will, can inform um, what universities are doing in terms of equity and justice, right? They're part of the community, so hold them accountable. And again, that's you know a, a, a matter of numbers. It's a matter of um, uh, uh, communities, uh, self-empowerment of communities and uh, using that power to hold people accountable, hold universities accountable, and hold them um, responsible for the very policies and 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 practices that uh, that they say that they're supposed to be doing. So 
I think that would be a great future direction, but the combination of you know, integrating EDI or integrating equity and justice throughout the entire university and university systems and not seeing it as a separate silo. And then you know, enlisting community groups and communities because the, you know, the school is part of the community. So let's, let's hold them accountable as community um, practitioners, as community members, as community groups, let's hold them accountable for what it is they say they are going to do or are doing. Thank you. Uh, Corinne, did you want to add something quickly I just, before? I, I just have to say this. The action plans have to be led by the rationalized community. An action plan cannot be led by somebody who's not in the community. Don't speak for me. Don't think for me. If our voices, if we're, if we're having these conversations, my voices need to be respected and they need to be part of the action plan. And this is a huge problem also with the institutionalization of EDI. They take the information, they have all these different meetings, they take your ideas and then they form these action plans and you're completely disconnected from what happened. The action plan needs to be done in collaboration with the rationalized community. You don't know what it's like to be black. You don't know what it's like to be Asian. You don't know what it's like to be Aboriginal. So you can't speak for it. And that it go, and it contradicts completely what EDI work is. So it's really important that when these works are done, we are directly involved and we're part of making solutions with whoever is in position of power. That's all I needed to say. I'm just gonna jump in and say, yes, absolutely. And I think that's again, the power and strength of the community, right? Um, if, you're, if you're nothing about us without us. So um, if, if equity and justice is on your radar and that's what you're professing that you're gonna be doing, communities need to be involved. Students need to be involved. Faculty and staff need to be involved. But I really think an angle that has not been explored our community um, collectives, to be honest, and, and the power that communities have to hold institutions responsible. Thank you so much. Um, I think that since we started five minutes late, if everyone's okay, but if you need to leave, it's totally fine. We can just quickly um, address some of the questions from the audience in the last five minutes. Um, so we have a question here from the Q&A. How would you initiate students' participation and excitement around EDI at a school that currently does not have an EDI program in place? And similarly, Jennifer asked, how can you make more white people more interested in EDI and learn more about racism and how they can educate themselves on the subject? I'm just putting both of these questions out together because we don't have a lot of time and they're also kind of related to each other. Corinne, go ahead. I'm just going to answer the second question because um, white people have a tendency to think they're outside of the race. They don't realize that they're as involved in the system as we are. And if once they start understanding that they are part of the system and they're involved in the system, they don't see themselves outside of the system. When you think about uh, entitlement, white entitlement, white fragility, when it's, all of these are consequences of being part of a system that have divided race people by race. So they're not necessarily outside of the system. That, that's the first thing that they need to understand that they have a moral responsibility, a social responsibility and get away from intentions to accountability and have acknowledged that their position has entitled them to certain resources that others might not have. So you're not outside of it. Just because you're privileged to have certain accessibility to resources, you're not outside of it. You're, you're directly implicated in, in these exchanges. I think that's that's the mind frame that I would I would introduce it, but obviously in a more structured way. And to get you know to get students involved, I think is just by having um, different activities on campus. That's what I did. I did a, I did a lot of activities to show the richness of the history of Black Canadian history, Caribbean history, African histories on campuses that is completely invisibilized in the educational system by bringing forward these history and these these kind of conversations to see that you know we're not all poor we don't all live in certain areas like and when we look at our arts and our culture and the way we are as individual people will be drawn to want to know about the history and, and infiltrate themselves they were also robbed by the system by not being educated about different rationalized communities and their contributions 
Totally. And I think it also comes back to the importance of what we were talking about before, um, education in high school and, you know, starting early, even elementary school. This isn't really the topic of today's panel, but um, it's great to know that Corinne and Hannah, you're both involved in providing workshops related to EDI and different EDI issues um, in the lower than university level. So does anyone else have any ideas about how to get people engaged in EDI initiatives? Oh, Taylor. Yeah, I was just going to say, if you're having, if you're at an institution that doesn't promote EDI and you're, this is something that you really want to work in, I think you also have to remember that EDI, as we've all been talking about, is not limited to academic institutions in the sense that EDI is for the community. So if you want to use your set of skills, if you want to, you know, bring that passion to this work, you can find communities outside of academia that still allow you to promote EDI. So for example, I found my, like I don't do a lot inside the university and they have committees and things like that, but I really found my community of other indigenous scholars who are working in genetics. Um, and we have an international consortium that works towards genetics and data, data equity. And so that is EDI work that is not in a single institution, but that work has implications across all institutions. And so I think by just trying to find people with similar interests, whatever that is, it can be super niche like mine, like indigenous geneticists. It's a very small pool of people, but when we come together, we can make a really significant change. These people are publishing in like the New, New England Journal of Medicine. We're making waves with a very small resource of people, but it's because we're all putting our energy towards something bigger. So I think that's just where if you want to invest your energy and this is something that's important to you, um, find your community. It's out there. Carolyn, did you uh, want to say something? Just very quickly, I, I would also caution against this notion of um, racialized people, uh, people have been historically marginalized, um, taking on the work to educate um, <laughs> Europeans or white people uh, to learn about equity and justice. So that's not our place, nor is it our job, nor should it be our responsibility. So if someone is interested, then they should do the legwork. Um, they should be prepared. There's tons of research, you know, on 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 this, but um, it's not our job because it's not our problem. Racism is not my problem. I didn't cause it. I didn't start it. I didn't, you know, I my ancestors didn't start um, the whole racism game. So it's not my problem to solve. It really is a non-racialized problem to solve. It's all of our problem to solve. But I'm not going to do the legwork. I'm not going to do the brunt of the work to be to be helping people to, to come around to their uh, either acknowledgement or acceptance um, that equity and justice is necessary. That has to come from them. That's not gonna, you know, you can't, you can't force people or, or try to convince people that's important, whether it's important in an institution or important in the community. And so folks have to do their, they have to do their work. They, they can't burden people who are, who are impacted by inequities and injustices um, to, you know, do the legwork for them. So I just wanted to mention that. I think that's a really great point. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time now, but I want to thank each and every one of you for coming here. It was a super, super interesting discussion, and it definitely gave us uh, a lot of things to think about. And, um, I hope that this was super helpful for all the students who are participating and uh, as well, anyone who is not a student who's participating in kind of hearing the perspectives of students working in uh, this EDI realm. So thank you very much. And I hope everyone has a great weekend. So just to jump in there, um, I'd like to thank everyone here today for spending your Saturday with us. Um, and just before we wrap up, Officially, I want to, on behalf of Science and Policy Exchange, um, thank all the people that made uh, today's efforts possible.
Um, so the past few years have been a time of heightened attention for equity, diversity, and inclusions, not just in academic institutions, but also in the larger community. This has sparked important and eye-opening conversations about the barriers and challenges faced by underrepresented groups in academia, which includes, but is not limited to, women, Indigenous people, people with disabilities, members of visible minority groups, and members of the LGBTQ2 community. In most cases, these conversations have highlighted how academic institutions ultimately fail to support and foster an inclusive community for these marginalized individuals. Now, while this increased awareness and focus on EDI issues is an important first step, it's not enough by itself. In order to truly make academic institutions more diverse, inclusive, and equitable, we must collectively move together beyond just identifying and discussing the current problems of academia to working together to plan and enact action plans that create meaningful and concrete change in policy and procedures. That is what today was meant to be about, moving from EDI talk to EDI action. In today's sessions, we brought together a group of EDI stakeholders from different perspectives for a comprehensive discussion of the current landscape of EDI policy and action at Canadian institutions and future, gener future directions for the next generation of EDI change makers. On behalf of the Science and Policy Exchange team, I'd like to thank a few moments to acknowledge all the individuals that contributed to today's events. Um, first, I'd like to thank our partner Dimensions and particularly Natalie Podoskinski and Katie Selmier for their collaboration in organizing today's event. It was very insightful to hear about what the Dimensions team is working on in order to support EDI initiatives at post-secondary insti institutions. And I know the Action Plan Workshop will equip today's attendees with the skills that they need to concretely contribute to EDI action plans and initiatives at their own institutions. Next, I'd like to thank our five EDI practitioner panelists, Jocelyn Baker, Nancy Hansen, Kareen Morin, Andre Terezowski, and Jessica Vandenberg. Thank you for lending your expertise today to provide us with firsthand insight into the behind the scenes processes of EDI initiatives at academic institutions. From hearing about your personal experiences, we've learned a lot about the best strategies and practices for developing institutional EDI programs, as well as the current gaps and strategies that we can work together to achieve in the coming years. Of course, I'd like to thank our five student panelists, Corinne Cohen-Sanchez, Taylor Morisot, Karen Tang, Carolyn Tinglin, and Hannah Wakeling. Your insights today and the contributions that you all have made and will continue to make to your communities are sure to be an inspiration for all the students today that are attending at this workshop to try to get more involved in EDI initiatives in their own communities. Moreover, I'd like to thank our sponsors, the Fonds de Recherche de Quebec, Simon Fraser University, Université de, de Laval, the University of Ottawa, Wilfrid Laurier University, and McGill University for their financial support. Of course, today's event would not have been possible without our dedicated team of science and policy exchange volunteers, both those that appeared on your screens today to help moderate and facilitate panels and breakout rooms, as well as those have, who have been working behind the scenes over the past few months to make sure that everything ran smoothly today. And last but not least, I would like to thank all of you, everyone who took the time to register and attend for today's events. In doing so, you've all taken one first step towards putting EDI principles into action. I hope you can all take the best practices and skills that you've learned here today back to your own communities. And in this way, I hope we can all play a concrete role in contributing to meaningful and concrete action towards making Canada's academic and research institutions more diverse, inclusive, and equitable for everyone. Thank you very much, everyone.